Chapter One of Seven H. P. Lovecraft Stories The Beast in the Cave. The horrible conclusion which had been gradually intruding itself upon my confused and reluctant mind was now an awful certainty. I was lost, completely, hopelessly lost, in the vast and labyrinthine recesses of the Mammoth Cave. Turn as I might, in no direction could my straining vision seize on any object capable of serving as a guidepost to set me on the outward path. That never more should I behold the blessed light of day, or scan the pleasant hills and dales of the beautiful world outside, my reason could no longer entertain the slightest unbelief. Hope had departed. Yet indoctrinated as I was by a life of philosophical study, I derived no small measure of satisfaction from my unimpassioned demeanor, for although I had frequently read of the wild frenzies into which were thrown the victims of similar situations, I experienced none of these, but stood quiet as soon as I clearly realized the loss of my bearings. Nor did the thought that I had probably wandered beyond the utmost limits of an ordinary search cause me to abandon my composure even for a moment. If I must die, I reflected, then was this terrible yet majestic cavern as welcome a sepulchre as that which any churchyard might afford, a conception which carried with it more of tranquillity than of despair. Starving would prove my ultimate fate. Of this I was certain. Some I knew had gone mad under circumstances such as these, but I felt that this end would not be mine. My disaster was the result of no fault save my own, since unknown to the guide I had separated myself from the regular party of sightseers, and wandering for over an hour in forbidden avenues of the cave, had found myself unable to retrace the devious windings which I had pursued since forsaking my companions. Already my torch had begun to expire. Soon I would be enveloped by the total and almost palpable blackness of the bowels of the earth. As I stood in the waning, unsteady light, I idly wondered over the exact circumstances of my coming end. I remembered the accounts which I had heard of the colony of consumptives, who, taking their residence in this gigantic grotto to find health from the apparent salubrious air of the underground world, with its steady uniform temperature, pure air, and peaceful quiet, had found instead death in strange and ghastly forms. I had seen the sad remains of their ill-made cottages as I passed them by with the party and had wondered what unnatural influence a long sojourn in this immense and silent cavern would exert upon one as healthy and vigorous as I. Now, I grimly told myself, my opportunity for settling this point had arrived, provided that want of food should not bring me too speedy a departure from this life. As the last fitful rays of my torch faded into obscurity, I resolved to leave no stone unturned, no possible means of escape neglected. So, summoning all the powers possessed by my lungs, I set up a series of loud shoutings, in the vain hope of attracting the attention of the guide by my clamor. Yet, as I called, I believed in my heart that my cries were to no purpose, and that my voice, magnified and reflected by the numerous ramparts of the black maze about me, fell upon no ears save my own. All at once, however, my attention was fixed with a start, as I fancied that I heard the sound of soft approaching steps on the rocky floor of the cavern. Was my deliverance about to be accomplished so soon? Had then all my horrible apprehensions been for naught? And was the guide, having marked my unwarranted absence from the party, following my course and seeking me out in this limestone labyrinth? Whilst these joyful queries arose in my brain, I was on the point of renewing my cries, in order that my discoverer might come the sooner, when in an instant 
My delight was turned to horror as I listened, for my ever-acute ear, now sharpened in even greater degree by the complete silence of the cave, bore to my benumbed understanding the unexpected and dreadful knowledge that these footfalls were not like those of any mortal man. In the unearthly stillness of this subterranean region, the tread of the booted guide would have sounded like a series of sharp and incisive blows. These impacts were soft and stealthy, as of the paws of some feline. Besides, when I listened carefully, I seemed to trace the falls of four instead of two feet. I was now convinced that I had, by my own cries, aroused and attracted some wild beast, perhaps a mountain lion which had accidentally strayed within the cave. Perhaps, I considered, the Almighty had chosen me for a swifter and more merciful death than that of hunger. Yet the instinct of self-preservation, never wholly dormant, was stirred in my breast, and though escape from the oncoming peril might but spare me for a sterner and more lingering end, I determined, nevertheless, to part with my life at as high a price as I could command. Strange as it may seem, my mind conceived of no intent on the part of the visitor save that of hostility. Accordingly, I became very quiet, in the hope that the unknown beast would, in the absence of a guiding sound, lose its direction as I had, and thus pass me by. But this hope was not destined for realization, for the strange footfalls steadily advanced, the animal evidently having obtained my scent, which, in an atmosphere so absolutely free from all distracting influences as is that of the cave, could doubtless be followed at great distance. Seeing, therefore, that I must be armed for defense against an uncanny and unseen attack in the dark, I groped about me the largest of the fragments of rock, which were strewn upon all parts of the floor of the cavern in the vicinity, and, grasping one in each hand for immediate use, awaited with resignation the inevitable result. Meanwhile, the hideous pattering of the paws drew near. Certainly the conduct of the creature was exceedingly strange. Most of the time the tread seemed to be that of a quadruped, walking with singular lack of unison betwixt hind and forefeet. Yet at brief and infrequent intervals, I fancied that but two feet were engaged in the process of locomotion. I wondered what species of animal was to confront me. It must, I thought, be some unfortunate beast who had paid for its curiosity to investigate one of the entrances of the fearful grotto with a lifelong confinement in its interminable recesses. It doubtlessly obtained as food the eyeless fish, bats, and rats of the cave, as well as some of the ordinary fish that are wafted in at every fresh net of the green river, which communicates in some occult manner with the waters of the cave. I occupied my terrible vigil with grotesque conjectures of what alteration cave life might have wrought in the physical structure of the beast, remembering the awful appearances ascribed by local tradition to the consumptives who had died after long residence in the cave. Then I remembered with a start that, even should I succeed in felling my antagonist, I should never behold its form, as my torch had long since been extinct, and I was entirely unprovided with matches. The tension of my brain now became frightful. My disordered fancy conjured up hideous and fearsome shapes from the sinister darkness that surrounded me, and that actually seemed to press upon my body. Nearer, nearer, the dreadful footfalls approached. It seemed that I must give vent to a piercing scream, yet had I been sufficiently irresolute to attempt such a thing, my voice could scarce have responded. I was petrified, rooted to the spot. I doubted if my right arm would allow me to hurl its missile at the oncoming thing when the crucial moment should arrive. Now... The steady pat-pat of the steps was close at hand, now very close. I could hear the labored breathing of the animal, 
and terror-struck as I was, I realized that it must have come from a considerable distance and was correspondingly fatigued. Suddenly the spell broke. My right hand, guided by my ever-trustworthy sense of hearing, threw with full force the sharp-angled bit of limestone which it contained toward that point in the darkness from which emanated the breathing and pattering, and, wonderful to relate, it nearly reached its goal, for I heard the thing jump, landing at a distance away where it seemed to pause. Having readjusted my aim, I discharged my second missile, this time most effectively, for with a flood of joy I listened as the creature fell in what sounded like a complete collapse, and evidently remained prone and unmoving. Almost overpowered by the great relief which rushed over me, I reeled back against the wall. The breathing continued, in heavy, gasping inhalations and expirations, whence I realized that I had no more than wounded the creature, and now all desire to examine the thing ceased. At last something allied to groundless, superstitious fear had entered my brain, and I did not approach the body, nor did I continue to cast stones at it in order to complete the extinction of its life. Instead, I ran at full speed in what was, as nearly as I could estimate in my frenzied condition, the direction from which I had come. Suddenly I heard a sound, or rather a regular succession of sounds. In another instant they had resolved themselves into a series of sharp, metallic clicks. This time there was no doubt. It was the guide. And then I shouted, yelled, screamed, and even shrieked with joy, as I beheld in the vaulted arches above the faint and glimmering effulgence which I knew to be the reflected light of an approaching torch. I ran to meet the flare, and before I could completely understand what had occurred, was lying upon the ground at the feet of the guide, embracing his boots and gibbering, despite my boasted reserve, in a most meaningless and idiotic manner, pouring out my terrible story, and at the same time overwhelming my auditor with protestations of gratitude. At length I awoke to something like my normal consciousness. The guide had noted my absence upon the arrival of the party at the entrance of the cave, and had, from his own intuitive sense of direction, proceeded to make a thorough canvas of bypasses just ahead of where he had last spoken to me, locating my whereabouts after a quest of about four hours. By the time he had related this to me, I, emboldened by his torch and his company, began to reflect upon the strange beast which I had wounded but a short distance back in the darkness and suggested that we ascertain, by the flashlight's aid, what manner of creature was my victim. Accordingly I retraced my steps, this time with a courage born of companionship, to the scene of my terrible experience. Soon we descried a white object upon the floor, an object whiter even than the gleaming limestone itself. Cautiously advancing, we gave vent to a simultaneous ejaculation of wonderment, for of all the unnatural monsters either of us had in our lifetimes beheld, this was in surpassing degree the strangest. It appeared to be an anthropoid ape of large proportions, escaped perhaps from some itinerant menagerie. Its hair was snow-white, a thing due no doubt to the bleaching action of a long existence within the inky confines of the cave, but it was also surprisingly thin, being indeed largely absent save on the head where it was of such length and abundance that it fell over the shoulders in considerable profusion. The face was turned away from us, as the creature lay almost directly upon it. The inclination of the limbs was very singular, explaining, however, the alternation in their use which I had before noted, whereby the beast used sometimes all four, and on other occasions but two for its progress. From the tips of the fingers or toes long rat-like claws extended. The hands or feet were not prehensile, 
a fact that I ascribe to that long residence in the cave which, as I before mentioned, seemed evident from the all-pervading and almost unearthly whiteness so characteristic of the whole anatomy. No tail seemed to be present. The respiration had now grown very feeble, and the guide had drawn his pistol with the evident intent of dispatching the creature, when a sudden sound emitted by the latter caused the weapon to fall unused. The sound was of a nature difficult to describe. It was not like the normal note of any known species of simian, and I wonder if this unnatural quality were not the result of a long, continued, and complete silence, broken by the sensations produced by the advent of the light, a thing which the beast could not have seen since its first entrance into the cave. The sound, which I might feebly attempt to classify as a kind of deep-toned chattering, was faintly continued. All at once a fleeting spasm of energy seemed to pass through the frame of the beast. The paws went through a convulsive motion, and the limbs contracted. With a jerk the white body rolled over, so that its face was turned in our direction. For a moment I was so struck with horror at the eyes thus revealed that I noted nothing else. They were black, those eyes, deep, jetty black, in hideous contrast to the snow-white hair and flesh. Like those of other cave denizens, they were deeply sunken in their orbits, and were entirely destitute of iris. As I looked more closely, I saw that they were set in a face less prognathous than that of the average ape, and infinitely less hairy. The nose was quite distinct. As we gazed upon the uncanny sight presented to our vision, the thick lips opened, and several sounds issued from them, after which the thing relaxed in death. The guide clutched my coat-sleeve and trembled so violently that the light shook fitfully, casting weird moving shadows on the walls. I made no motion, but stood rigidly still, my horrified eyes fixed upon the floor ahead. The fear left, and wonder, awe, compassion, and reverence succeeded in its place, for the sounds uttered by the stricken figure that lay stretched out on the limestone had told us the awesome truth. The creature I had killed, the strange beast of the unfathomed cave, was, or had at one time been, a man. End of The Beast in the Cave Chapter 2 of 7 H. P. Lovecraft Stories the White Ship by Howard Phillips Lovecraft I am Basil Elton, keeper of the North Point Light, that my father and grandfather kept before me. Far from the shore stands the grey lighthouse, above sunken slimy rocks that are seen when the tide is low, but unseen when the tide is high. Past that beacon for a century have swept the majestic barks of the seven seas, in the days of my grandfather there were many, in the days of my father not so many, and now there are so few that I sometimes feel strangely alone, as though I were the last person on our planet. From far shores came those white-sailed argosies of old, from far eastern shores where warm suns shine and sweet odors linger about strange gardens and gay temples. The old captains of the sea came often to my grandfather and told him of these things, which in turn he told to my father, and my father told to me in the long autumn evenings when the wind howled eerily from the east. And I have read more of these things, and of many things besides, in the books men gave me when I was young and filled with wonder. But more wonderful than the lore of old men and the lore of books, is the secret lore of ocean. Blue, green, gray, white, or black, smooth, ruffled, or mountainous, that ocean is not silent. All my days have I watched it and listened to it, and I know it well. At first it told me only the plain little tales of calm beaches and near ports. 
but with the years it grew more friendly and spoke of other things, of things more strange and more distant in space and in time. Sometimes at twilight the gray vapors of the horizon have parted to grant me glimpses of the ways beyond, and sometimes at night the deep waters of the sea have grown clear and phosphorescent to grant me glimpses of the ways beneath. And these glimpses have been as often of the ways that were and the ways that might be as of the ways that are. For ocean is more ancient than the mountains, and freighted with the memories and the dreams of time. Out of the south it was that the white ship used to come when the moon was full and high in the heavens. Out of the south it would glide very smoothly and silently over the sea, and whether the sea was rough or calm, and whether the wind was friendly or adverse, it would always glide smoothly and silently, its sails distant and its long strange tiers of oars moving rhythmically. One night I espied upon the deck a man, bearded and robed, and he seemed to beckon me to embark for fair unknown shores. Many times afterward I saw him under the full moon, and ever did he beckon me. Very brightly did the moon shine on the night I answered the call, and I walked out over the waters to the white ship on a bridge of moonbeams. The man who had beckoned now spoke a welcome to me in a soft language I seemed to know well, and the hours were filled with soft songs of the oarsmen as we glided away into a mysterious south, golden with the glow of that full, mellow moon. And when the day dawned, rosy and effulgent, I beheld the green shore of far lands, bright and beautiful, and to me unknown. Up from the sea rose lordly terraces of verdure, tree-studded, and showing here and there the gleaming white roofs and colonnades of strange temples. As we drew nearer the green shore, the bearded man told me of that land, the land of Zar, where dwelt all the dreams and thoughts of beauty that come to men once and then are forgotten. And when I looked upon the terraces again, I saw that what he said was true, for among the sights before me were many things I had once seen through the mists beyond the horizon in the phosphorescent depths of ocean. There, too, were forms and fantasies more splendid than I had ever known, the visions of young poets who died in want before the world could learn of what they had seen and dreamed. But we did not set foot upon the sloping meadows of Zar, for it is told that he who treads them may never more return to his native shore. As the white ship sailed silently away from the templed terraces of Zar, we beheld, on the distant horizon ahead, the spires of a mighty city, and the bearded man said to me, This is Thalarion, the city of a thousand wonders, wherein reside all those mysteries that man has striven in vain to fathom. And I looked again at closer range, and saw that the city was greater than any city I had known or dreamed of before. Into the sky the spires of its temples reached, so that no man might behold their peaks, and far back beyond the horizon stretched the grim gray walls, over which one might spy only a few roofs, weird and ominous, yet adorned with rich friezes and alluring sculptures. I yearned mightily to enter this fascinating yet repellent city, and beseech the bearded man to land me at the stone pier by the huge carven gate Akariel. But he gently denied my wish, saying, Into Thalarion, the city of a thousand wonders, many have passed, but none returned. Therein walk only demons and mad things that are no longer men, and the streets are white with the unburied bones of those who have looked upon the Eidolon Lathi that reigns over the city. So the white ship sailed on past the walls of Thalarion, and followed for many days a southward flying bird, 
whose glossy plumage matched the sky out of which it had appeared. Then came we to a pleasant coast, gay with blossoms of every hue, where as far inland as we could see basked lovely groves and radiant arbors beneath a meridian sun. From bowers beyond our view came bursts of song and snatches of lyric harmony, interspersed with faint laughter, so delicious that I urged the rowers onward in my eagerness to reach the scene. And the bearded man spoke no word, but watched me as we approached the lily-lined shore. Suddenly a wind blowing from over the flowery meadows and leafy woods brought a scent at which I trembled. The wind grew stronger, and the air was filled with the lethal charnel odor of plague-stricken towns and uncovered cemeteries. And as we sailed madly away from that damnable coast, the bearded man spoke at last, saying, This is Exora, the land of pleasures unattained. So once more the white ship followed the bird of heaven, over warm, blessed seas, fanned by caressing, aromatic breezes. Day after day and night after night did we sail, and when the moon was full we would listen to soft songs of the oarsmen, sweet as on that distant night when we sailed away from my far native land. And it was by moonlight that we anchored at last in the harbor of Sonia Nil, which is guarded by twin headlands of crystal that rise from the sea and meet in a resplendent arch. This is the land of fancy, and we walked to the verdant shores upon a golden bridge of moonbeams. In the land of Sonia Nil, there is neither time nor space, neither suffering nor death, and there I dwelt for many aeons. Green are the groves and pastures, bright and fragrant the flowers, blue and musical the streams, clear and cool the fountains, and stately and gorgeous the temples, castles, and cities of Sonia Nil. Of that land there is no bound, for beyond each vista of beauty rises another more beautiful. Over the countryside and amid the splendor of cities can move at will the happy folk of whom all are gifted with unmarred grace and unalloyed happiness. For the aeons that I dwelt there, I wandered blissfully through gardens where quaint pagodas peep from pleasing clumps of bushes, and where the white walks are bordered with delicate blossoms. I climbed gentle hills, from whose summits I could see entrancing panoramas of loveliness, with steepled towns nestled in verdant valleys, and with the golden domes of gigantic cities glittering on the infinitely distant horizon. And I viewed by moonlight the sparkling sea, the crystal headlands, and the placid harbor wherein lay anchored the white ship. It was against the full moon one night in the immemorial year of Tharp that I saw outlined the beckoning form of the celestial bird, and felt the first stirrings of unease. Then I spoke with the bearded man, and told him of my new yearning to depart for remote Catharia, which no man has seen, but which all believe to lie beyond the basalt pillars of the West. It is the land of hope and in it shine the perfect ideals of all that we know elsewhere, or at least so men relate. But the bearded man said to me, Beware of those perilous seas wherein men say Cather realize. In Sonia Nil there is no pain nor death, but who can tell what lies beyond the basalt pillars of the West? Natheless, at the next full moon, I boarded the white ship, and with the reluctant bearded man left the happy harbor for untraveled seas. And the bird of heaven flew before me, and led us toward the basalt pillars of the west, but this time the oarsmen sang no soft songs under the full moon. In my mind I would often picture the unknown land of Catharia, with its splendid groves and palaces, and would wonder what new delights there awaited me. Catharia! I would say to myself, is the abode of gods, 
and the land of unnumbered cities of gold. Its forests are of aloe and sandalwood, even as the fragrant groves of Camarin. And among the trees flutter gay birds sweet with song. On the green and flowery mountains of Catharia stand temples of pink marble, rich with carven and painted glories, and having in their courtyards cool fountains of silver, where pearl with ravishing music the scented waters that come from the grotto born river Narg. And the cities of Catharia are cinctured with golden walls, and their pavements are also of gold. In the gardens of these cities are strange orchids, and perfumed lakes, whose beds are of coral and amber. At night the streets and the gardens are lit with gay lanthorns fashioned from three-colored shell of the tortoise, and here resound the soft notes of the singer and the lutenist. And the houses of the cities of Catharia are all palaces, each built over a fragrant canal bearing the waters of the sacred Narg. Of marble and porphyry are the houses, and roofed with glittering gold that reflects the rays of the sun and enhances the splendor of the city as blissful gods view them from the distant peaks. Fairest of all is the palace of the great monarch Darib, whom some say to be a demigod and others a god. High is the palace of Darib, and many are the torrents of marble upon its walls. In its wide halls may multitudes assemble, and here hang the trophies of the ages, and the roof is of pure gold, set upon tall pillars of ruby and azure, and having such carven figures of gods and heroes that he who looks up to those heights seem to gaze upon the living Olympus. And the floor of the palace is of glass, under which flow the cunningly lighted waters of the Narg, gay with gaudy fish, not known beyond the bounds of lovely Catharia. Thus I would speak to myself of Catharia, but ever would the bearded man warn me to turn back to the happy shores of Sonal-Nil, for Sonal-Nil is known of men, while none hath ever beheld Catharia. And on the thirty-first day that we followed the bird, we beheld the basalt pillars of the west. Shrouded in mist they were, so that no man might peer beyond them or see their summits, which indeed some say reach even to the heavens. And the bearded man again implored me to turn back. But I heeded him not, for from the mists beyond the basalt pillars I fancy there came the notes of singer and lutenist, sweeter than the sweetest songs of Sonalil, and sounding mine own praises, the praises of me, who had voyaged far under the full moon and dwelt in the land of fancy. So to the sound of melody the white ship sailed into the mist betwixt the basalt pillars of the west. And when the music ceased and the mist lifted, we beheld not the land of Catharia, but a swift rushing, restless sea, over which our helpless bark was borne toward some unknown goal. Soon to our ears came the distant thunder of falling waters, and to our eyes appeared on the far horizon ahead the titanic spray of a monstrous cataract, wherein the oceans of the world drop down to abysmal nothingness. Then did the bearded man say to me with tears on his cheek, We have rejected the beautiful land of Sonanil, which we may never behold again. The gods are greater than men, and they have conquered. And I closed my eyes before the crash that I knew would come, shutting out the sight of the celestial bird which flapped its mocking blue wings over the brink of the torrent. Out of that crash came darkness, and I heard the shrieking of men and of things which were not men. From the east tempestuous winds arose, and chilled me as I crouched on the slab of damp stone which had risen beneath my feet. Then, as I heard another crash, I opened my eyes, and beheld myself upon the platform of that lighthouse from whence I had sailed so many aeons ago. In the darkness below there loomed the vast, blurred outlines of a vessel 
breaking up on the cruel rocks, and as I glanced out over the waste I saw that the light had failed for the first time since my grandfather had assumed its care. And in the latter watches of the night, when I went within the tower, I saw on the wall a calendar which still remained as when I had left it at the hour I sailed away. With the dawn I descended the tower and looked for wreckage upon the rocks, but what I found was only this, a strange dead bird whose hue was as of the azure sky and a single shattered spar of a whiteness greater than that of the wave-tips or of the mountain snow. And thereafter the ocean told me its secrets no more, and though many times since has the moon shone full and high in the heavens, the white ship from the south never came again. End of The White Ship Chapter Three of Seven H. P. Lovecraft Stories. In Yarlathotep, the crawling chaos. I am the last. I will tell the audient void. I do not recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger, a danger widespread and all-embracing, such as danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces, and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land, and out of the abysses between the stars swept chill currents that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demoniac alteration in the sequence of the seasons. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world, and perhaps the universe, had passed from the control of known gods or forces to that of gods or forces which were unknown. And it was then that Enyarlathotep came out of Egypt. Who he was none could tell, but he was of the old native blood, and looked like a pharaoh. The fellahin knelt when they saw him, yet could not say why. He said he had risen up out of the blackness of twenty-seven centuries, and that he had heard messages from places not on this planet. Into the lands of civilization came Inyarlathotep, swarthy, slender, and sinister, always buying strange instruments of glass and metal, and combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of the sciences, of electricity and psychology, and gave exhibitions of power which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which swelled his fame to exceeding magnitude. Men advised one another to see Inyarlathotep, and shuddered. And where Inyarlathotep went, rest vanished, for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. Never before had the screams of nightmare been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wished they could forbid sleep in the small hours, that the shrieks of cities might less horribly disturb the pale pitying moon as it glimmered on green waters gliding under bridges and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. I remember when Inyarlathotep came to my city, the great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him, and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelations and I burned with eagerness to explore his uttermost mysteries. My friends said they were horrible and impressive beyond my most fevered imaginings, that what was thrown on a screen in the darkened room prophesied things none but in your Lothotep dare prophesy, and that in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which showed only in the eyes and I heard it hinted abroad that those who knew in Yarlathotep looked on sights which others saw not. 
It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with the restless crowds to see in your Lothotep. Through the stifling night and up the endless stairs into the choking room, and shadowed on a screen, I saw hooded forms amid ruins, and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments. And I saw the world battling against blackness, against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling around the dimming, cooling sun. Then the sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators, and hair stood up on end, whilst shadows more grotesque than I can tell came out and squatted on the heads. And when I, who was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about imposture and static electricity, in your Lafotep drave us all out, down the dizzy stairs, into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets. I screamed aloud that I was not afraid, that I never could be afraid, and others screamed with me for solace. We swore at one another that the city was exactly the same and still alive, and when the electric lights began to fade, we cursed the company over and over again and laughed at the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something coming down from the greenish moon, for when we began to depend on its light, we drifted into curious involuntary marching formations, and seemed to know our destinations, though we dared not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement, and found the blocks loose and displaced by grass, with scarce a line of rusted metal to show where the tramways had run. And again we saw a tram-car, lone, windowless, dilapidated, and almost on its side. When we gazed around the horizon, we could not find the third tower by the river, and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was ragged at the top. Then we split up into narrow columns, each of which seemed drawn in a different direction. One disappeared in a narrow alley to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moan. Another filed down a weed-choked subway entrance, howling with laughter that was mad. My own column was sucked toward the open country, and presently felt a chill which was not of the hot autumn, for as we stalked out on the dark moor, we beheld around us the hellish moon-glitter of evil snows. Trackless, inexplicable snows swept asunder in one direction only, where lay a gulf all the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin indeed as it plodded dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind, for the black rift in the green litten snow was frightful, and I thought I had heard the reverberations of a disquieting wail as my companions vanished. But my power to linger was slight. As if beckoned by those who had gone before, I half floated between the titanic snowdrifts, quivering and afraid, into the sightless vortex of the unimaginable. Screamingly sentient, dumbly delirious, only the gods that were can tell. A sickened, sensitive shadow writhing in hands that are not hands, and whirl blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel winds that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low. Beyond the worlds, Vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up to dizzy vacua above the spheres of light and darkness. And through this revolving graveyard of the universe, the muffled, maddening beating of drums and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable, unlighted chambers beyond time, the detestable pounding and piping wherein to dance slowly, awkwardly, and absurdly the gigantic, tenebrous, ultimate gods, the blind, 
voiceless, mindless gargoyles whose soul is in your lothotep. End of In Your Lothotep Chapter 4 The Alchemist High up, crowning the grassy summit of a swelling mound whose sides are wooded near the base with the gnarled trees of the primeval forest, stands the old chateau of my ancestors. For centuries its lofty battlements have frowned down upon the wild and rugged countryside about, serving as a home and stronghold for the proud house whose honored line is older even than the moss-grown castle walls. These ancient turrets, stained by the storms of generations and crumbling under the slow yet mighty pressure of time, formed in the ages of feudalism one of the most dreaded and formidable fortresses in all France. From its maculated parapets and mounted battlements, barons, counts, and even kings have been defied. Yet never had its spacious halls resounded to the footstep of the invader. But since those glorious years all is changed. A poverty but little above the level of dire want, together with a pride of name that forbids its alleviation by the pursuits of commercial life, have prevented the scions of our line from maintaining their estates in pristine splendor, and the falling stones of the walls, the overgrown vegetation in the parks, the dry and dusty boat, the ill-paved courtyards and toppling towers without, as well as the sagging floors, the worm-eaten wainscots, and the faded tapestries within, all tell a gloomy tale of fallen grandeur. As the ages passed, first one, then another of the four great turrets were left to ruin, until the last but a single tower housed the sadly reduced descendants of the once mighty lords of the estate. It was in one of the vast and gloomy chambers of this remaining tower that I, Antoine, last of the unhappy and accursed Comtes de C, first saw the light of day ninety long years ago. Within these walls, and amongst the dark and shadowy forests, the wild ravines and grottoes of the hillside below, were spent the first years of my troubled life. My parents I never knew. My father had been killed at the age of thirty-two, a month before I was born, by the fall of a stone somehow dislodged from one of the deserted parapets of the castle, and my mother having died at my birth, my care and education devolved solely upon one remaining servitor, an old and trusted man of considerable intelligence, whose name I remember as Pierre. I was an only child, and the lack of companionship which this fact entailed upon me was augmented by the strange care exercised by my aged guardian in excluding me from the society of the peasant children whose abodes were scattered here and there upon the plains that surround the base of the hill. At the time, Pierre said that this restriction was imposed upon me because my noble birth placed me above association with such plebeian company. Now I know that its real object was to keep from my ears the idle tales of the dread curse upon our line, that were nightly told and magnified by the simple tenantry as they conversed in hushed accents in the glow of their cottage hearths. Thus isolated and thrown upon my own resources, I spent the hours of my childhood in poring over the ancient tomes that filled the shadow-haunted library of the chateau, and in roaming, without aim or purpose, through the perpetual dusk of the spectral wood that clothes the sides of the hill near its foot. It was perhaps an effect of such surroundings that my mind early acquired a shade of melancholy. Those studies and pursuits which partake of the dark and occult in nature most strongly claimed my attention. Of my own race I was permitted to learn singularly little, yet what small knowledge of it I was able to gain seemed to depress me much. 
Perhaps it was at first only the manifest reluctance of my old preceptor to discuss with me my paternal ancestry that gave rise to the terror which I ever felt at the mention of my great house, yet as I grew out of childhood I was able to piece together disconnected fragments of discourse let slip from the unwilling tongue which had begun to falter in approaching senility that had a sort of relation to a certain circumstance which I had always deemed strange, but which now became dimly terrible. The circumstance to which I allude is the early age at which all the comps of my line have met their end. Whilst I had hitherto considered this but a natural attribute of a family of short-lived men, I afterward pondered long upon these premature deaths and began to connect them with the wanderings of the old man, who often spoke of a curse which for centuries had prevented the lives of the holders of my title from much exceeding the span of thirty-two years. Upon my twenty-first birthday, the aged Pierre gave to me a family document which he said had for many generations been handed down from father to son, and continued by each possessor. Its contents were of the most startling nature, and its perusal confirmed the gravest of my apprehensions. At this time my belief in the supernatural was firm and deep-seated, else I should have dismissed with scorn the incredible narrative unfolded before my eyes. The paper carried me back to the days of the thirteenth century, when the old castle in which I sat had been a feared and impregnable fortress. It told of a certain ancient man who had once dwelt on our estates, a person of no small accomplishments, though little above the rank of peasant, by name Michael, usually designated by the surname of Mauvais the Evil on account of his sinister reputation. He had studied beyond the custom of his kind, seeking such things as the Philosopher's Stone or the Elixir of Eternal Life, and was reputed wise in the terrible secrets of black magic and alchemy. Michael Mauvais had one son named Charles, a youth as proficient as himself in the hidden arts, and who had therefore been called Le Sorcier, or the Wizard. This pair, shunned by all honest folk, were suspected of the most hideous practices. Old Michael was said to have burnt his wife alive as a sacrifice to the devil, and the unaccountable disappearances of many small peasant children were laid at the dreaded door of these two. Yet through the dark natures of the father and the son ran one redeeming ray of humanity. The evil old man loved his offspring with fierce intensity, whilst the youth had for his parent a more than filial affection. One night the castle on the hill was thrown into the wildest confusion by the vanishment of young Godfrey, son to Henri the Comte. A searching party, headed by the frantic father, invaded the cottage of the sorcerers, and there came upon old Michael Moves, busy over a huge and violently boiling cauldron. Without certain cause, in the ungoverned madness of fury and despair, the Comte laid hands on the aged wizard, and ere he released his murderous hold, his victim was no more. Meanwhile joyful servants were proclaiming aloud the finding of young Godfrey in a distant and unused chamber of the great edifice, telling too late that poor Michael had been killed in vain. As the Comte and his associates turned away from the lowly abode of the alchemists, the form of Charles Le Sorcier appeared through the trees. The excited chatter of the menials standing about told him what had occurred, yet he seemed at first unmoved at his father's fate. Then, slowly advancing to meet the Comte, he pronounced in dull yet terrible accents the curse that ever afterward haunted the house of C. May ne'er a noble of thy murderous line survive to reach a greater age than thine. 
spake he, when, suddenly leaping backwards into the black wood, he drew from his tunic a phial of colorless liquid, which he threw in the face of his father's slayer as he disappeared behind the inky curtain of the night. The Comte died without utterance, and was buried the next day, but little more than two and thirty years from the hour of his birth. No trace of the assassin could be found, though relentless bands of peasants scoured the neighboring woods and the meadowlands around the hill. Thus time and the want of a reminder dulled the memory of the curse in the minds of the late Comte's family, so that when Godfrey, innocent cause of the whole tragedy and now bearing the title, was killed by an arrow while hunting at the age of thirty-two, there were no thoughts save those of grief at his demise. But when, years afterward, the next young Comte, Robert by name, was found dead in a nearby field from no apparent cause, the peasants told in whispers that their seigneur had but lately passed his thirty-second birthday when surprised by early death. Louis, son of Robert, was found drowned in the moat at the same fateful age, and thus down through the centuries ran the ominous chronicle, Henri, Roberts, Antoines, and Armands, snatched from happy and virtuous lives when a little below the age of their unfortunate ancestor at his murder. That I had left at most but eleven years of further existence was made certain to me by the words which I read. My life, previously held at small value, now became dearer to me each day, as I delved deeper and deeper into the mysteries of the hidden world of black magic. Isolated as I was, modern science had produced no impression upon me, and I labored as in the Middle Ages, as rapt as had been old Michael and young Charles themselves, in the acquisition of demoniacal and alchemedic learning. Yet, read as I might, in no manner could I account for the strange curse upon my line. In unusually rational moments I would even go so far as to seek a natural explanation, attributing the early deaths of my ancestors to the sinister Charles Le Saussier and his heirs. Yet, having found upon careful inquiry, that there were no known descendants of the alchemist, I would fall back to my occult studies, and once more endeavor to find a spell that would release my house from its terrible burden. Upon one thing I was absolutely resolved. I should never wed, for since no other branches of my family were in existence, I might thus end the curse with myself. As I drew near the age of thirty, old Pierre was called to the land beyond. Alone I buried him beneath the stones of the courtyard, about which he had loved to wander in life. Thus was I left to ponder on myself as the only human creature within the great fortress, and in my utter solitude my mind began to cease its vain protest against the impending doom to become almost reconciled to the fate which so many of my ancestors had met. Much of my time was now occupied in the exploration of the ruined and abandoned halls and towers of the old chateau, which in youth fear had caused me to shun, and some of which old Pierre had once told me had not been trodden by human foot for over four centuries. Strange and awesome were many of the objects I encountered. Furniture, covered by the dust of ages, and crumbling with the rot of long dampness, met my eyes. Cobwebs, in a profusion never before seen by me, were spun everywhere, and huge bats flapped their bony and uncanny wings on all sides of the otherwise untenanted gloom. Of my exact age, even down to days and hours, I kept a most careful record, for each movement of the pendulum of the massive clock in the library told off so much more of my doomed existence. At length I approached that time which I had so long viewed with apprehension. 
since most of my ancestors had been seized some little while before they reached the exact age of the Comte Henri at his end, I was every moment on the watch for the coming of the unknown death. In what strange form the curse should overtake me, I knew not, but I was resolved at least that it should not find me a cowardly or a passive victim. With new vigor I applied myself to my examination of the old chateau and its contents. It was upon one of the longest of all my excursions of discovery in the deserted portion of the castle, less than a week before that fatal hour which I felt must mark the utmost limit of my stay on earth, beyond which I could not have even the slightest hope of continuing to draw breath, that I came upon the culminating event of my whole life. I had spent the better part of the morning in climbing up and down half-ruined staircases in one of the most dilapidated of the ancient turrets. As the afternoon progressed, I sought the lower levels, descending into what appeared to be either a medieval place of confinement or a more recently excavated storehouse for gunpowder. As I slowly traversed the nitre-encrusted passageway at the foot of the last staircase, the paving became very damp, and soon I saw by the light of my flickering torch that a blank, water-stained wall impeded my journey. Turning to retrace my steps, my eye fell upon a small trap-door with a ring which lay directly beneath my feet. Pausing, I succeeded with difficulty in raising it, whereupon there was revealed a black aperture, exhaling noxious fumes which caused my torch to sputter, and disclosing in the unsteady glare the top of a flight of stone steps. As soon as the torch, which I lowered into the repellent depths, burned freely and steadily, I commenced my descent. These steps were many, and led to a narrow stone-flagged passage, which I knew must be far underground. This passage proved of great length, and terminated in a massive oaken door, dripping with the moisture of the place, and stoutly resisting all my attempts to open it. Ceasing after a time my efforts in this direction, I had proceeded back some distance toward the steps, when there suddenly fell to my experience one of the most profound and maddening shocks capable of reception by the human mind. Without warning, I heard the massive door behind me creak slowly open upon its rusted hinges. My immediate sensations are incapable of analysis. To be confronted in a place as thoroughly deserted as I had deemed the old castle, with evidence of the presence of man or spirit, produced in my brain a horror of the most acute description. When at last I turned and faced the seat of the sound, my eyes must have started from their orbits at the sight that they beheld. There, in the ancient Gothic doorway, stood a human figure. It was that of a man clad in a skull-cap and long medieval tunic of dark color, his long hair and flowing beard were of a terrible and intense black hue, and of incredible profusion. His forehead, high beyond the usual dimensions, his cheeks deep, sunken, and heavily lined with wrinkles, and his hands, long, claw-like, and gnarled, were of such a deathly marble-like whiteness as I have never elsewhere seen in man. His figure— lean to the proportions of a skeleton, was strangely bent and almost lost within the voluminous folds of his peculiar garment. But the strangest of all were his eyes, twin caves of abysmal blackness, profound in expression of understanding, yet inhuman in degrees of wickedness. These were now fixed upon me, piercing my soul with their hatred, and rooting me to the spot whereon I stood. At last the figure spoke in a rumbling voice that chilled me through with its dull hollowness and latent malevolence. The language in which the discord was clothed was that debased form of Latin in use amongst the more learned men of the Middle Ages, 
and made familiar to me by my prolonged researches into the works of the old alchemists and demonologists. The apparition spoke of the curse which had hovered over my house, told me of my coming end, dwelt on the wrong perpetuated by my ancestor against old Michael Mauvais, and gloated over the revenge of Charles Le Saussier. He told me how the young Charles had escaped into the night, returning in after years to kill Godfrey the heir with an arrow just as he approached the age which had been his father's at his assassination, how he had secretly returned to the estate and established himself unknown in the even then deserted subterranean chamber whose doorway now framed the hideous narrator. How he had seized Robert, son of Godfrey, in a field, forced poison down his throat, and left him to die at the age of thirty-two, thus maintaining the foul provisions of his vengeful curse. At this point I was left to imagine the solution of the greatest mystery of all, how the curse had been fulfilled since that time when Charles Le Saussier must in the course of nature have died for the man digressed into an account of the deep alchemical studies of the two wizards, father and son, speaking most particularly of the researches of Charles Le Saussier, concerning the elixir which should grant to him who partook of it eternal life and youth. His enthusiasm had seemed for the moment to remove from his terrible eyes the hatred that had at first so haunted them, but suddenly the fiendish glare returned, and with a shocking sound like the hissing of a serpent, the stranger raised a glass phial with the evident intent of ending my life, as had Charles Le Saussier six hundred years before ended that of my ancestor. Prompted by some preserving instinct of self-defense, I broke through the spell that had hitherto held me immovable and flung my now-dying torch at the creature who menaced my existence. I heard the phial break harmlessly against the stones of the passage as the tunic of the strange man caught fire and lit the horrid scene with a ghastly radiance. The shriek of fright and impotent malice emitted by the would-be assassin proved too much for my already shaken nerves, and I fell prone upon the slimy floor in a total faint. When at last my senses returned, all was frightfully dark, and my mind, remembering what had occurred, shrank from the idea of beholding more, yet curiosity overmastered all. Who, I asked myself, was this man of evil, and how came he within the castle walls? Why should he seek to avenge the death of poor Michael Mauvais? and how had the curse been carried on through all the long centuries since the time of Charles Le Saussier? The dread of years was lifted off my shoulders, for I knew that he whom I had felled was the source of all my danger from the curse, and now that I was free I burned with the desire to learn more of the sinister thing which had haunted my line for centuries and made my own youth one long-continued nightmare. Determined upon further exploration, I felt in my pockets for flint and steel, and lit the unused torch which I had with me. First of all, the new light revealed the distorted and blackened form of the mysterious stranger. The hideous eyes were now closed. Disliking the sight, I turned away and entered the chamber beyond the Gothic door. Here I found what seemed much like an alchemist's laboratory. In one corner was an immense pile of shining yellow metal that sparkled gorgeously in the light of the torch. It may have been gold, but I did not pause to examine it, for I was strangely affected by that which I had undergone. At the farther end of the apartment was an opening leading out into one of the many wild ravines of the dark hillside forest. Filled with wonder, yet now realizing how the man had obtained access to the chateau, I proceeded to return. I had intended to pass by the remains of the stranger with averted face, but as I approached the body I seemed to hear emanating from it 
a faint sound as the life were not yet wholly extinct. Aghast, I turned to examine the charred and shriveled figure on the floor. Then, all at once, the horrible eyes, blacker even than the seared face in which they were set, opened wide with an expression which I was unable to interpret. The cracked lips tried to frame words which I could not well understand. Once I caught the name of Charles Le Saussier, and again I fancied that the words years and curse issued from the twisted mouth. Still I was at a loss to gather the purport of his disconnected speech. At my evident ignorance of his meaning, the pitchy eyes once more flashed malevolently at me, until, helpless as I saw my opponent to be, I trembled as I watched him. Suddenly the wretch, animated with his last burst of strength, raised his hideous head from the damp and sunken pavement. Then, as I remained paralyzed with fear, he found his voice, and in his dying breath, screamed forth those words which have ever afterward haunted my days and my nights. Fool! he shrieked. Can you not guess my secret? Have you no brain whereby you may recognize the will which has through six long centuries fulfilled the dreadful curse upon your house? Have I not told you of the great elixir of eternal life? Know you not how the secret of alchemy was solved? I tell you, it is I, I that have lived for six hundred years to maintain my revenge. For I am... Charles Le Saussier. End of The Alchemist Chapter 5 The Shunned House Part 1 From even the greatest of horrors, irony is seldom absent. Sometimes it enters directly into the composition of the events, while sometimes it relates only to their fortuitous position among persons and places. The latter sort is splendidly exemplified by a case in the ancient city of Providence, where, in the late forties, Edgar Allan Poe used to sojourn often during his unsuccessful wooing of the gifted poetess Mrs. Whitman. Poe generally stopped at the mansion house in Benefit Street, the renamed Golden Ball Inn, whose roof has sheltered Washington, Jefferson, and Lafayette, and his favorite walk led northward along the same street to Mrs. Whitman's home and the neighboring hillside churchyard of St. John's, whose hidden expanse of eighteenth-century gravestones had for him a peculiar fascination. Now, the irony is this. In his walk, so many times repeated, the world's greatest master of the terrible and the bizarre, was obliged to pass a particular house on the eastern side of the street, a dingy, antiquated structure perched on the abruptly rising side hill, with a great unkempt yard dating from a time when the region was partly open country. It does not appear that he ever wrote or spoke of it, nor is there any evidence that he even noticed it. And yet that house, to the two persons in possession of certain information, equals or outranks in horror the wildest fantasy of the genius who so often passed it unknowingly, and stands starkly leering as a symbol of all that is unutterably hideous. The house was, and for that matter still is, of a kind to attract the attention of the curious. Originally a farm or semi-farm building, it followed the average New England colonial lines of the middle eighteenth century, the prosperous peaked roof sort, with two stories and dormerless attic, and the Georgian doorway and interior paneling dictated by the progress of taste at that time. It faced south, with one gable end buried to the lower windows in the eastward rising hill, and the other exposed to the foundations toward the street. Its construction, over a century and a half ago, 
had followed the grading and straightening of the road in that especial vicinity, for Benefit Street, at first called Black Street, was laid out as a lane winding amongst the graveyards of the first settlers, and straightened only when the removal of the bodies to the north burial ground made it decently possible to cut through the old family plots. At the start the western wall had lain some twenty feet up a precipitous lawn from the roadway, but a widening of the street at about the time of the Revolution sheared off most of the intervening space, exposing the foundations so that a brick basement wall had to be made, giving the deep cellar a street frontage with the door and one window above ground, close to the new line of public travel. When the sidewalk was laid out a century ago, the last of the intervening space was removed, and Poe, in his walks, must have seen only a sheer ascent of dull gray brick flush with the sidewalk, and surmounted at a height of ten feet by the antique shingled bulk of the house proper. The farm-like ground extended back very deeply up the hill, almost to Wheaton Street. The space south of the house, abutting on Benefit Street, was of course greatly above the existing sidewalk level, forming a terrace bounded by a high bank wall of damp, mossy stone, pierced by a steep flight of narrow steps which led inward between canyon-like surfaces to the upper region of mangy lawn, roomy brick walls, and neglected gardens, whose dismantled cement urns, rusted kettles fallen from tripods of knotty sticks, and similar paraphernalia set off the weather-beaten front door with its broken fanlight, rotting ionic pilasters, and wormy triangular pediment. What I heard in my youth about the shunned house was merely that people died there in alarmingly great numbers. That, I was told, was why the original owners had moved out some twenty years after building the place. It was plainly unhealthy. Perhaps because of the dampness and fungus growths in the cellar, the general sickish smell, the draughts of the hallways, or the quality of the well and pump water. These things were bad enough and these were all that gained belief among the persons whom I knew. Only the notebooks of my antiquarian uncle, Dr. Elihu Whipple, revealed to me at length the darker, vaguer surmises which formed an undercurrent of folklore among old-time servants and humble folk, surmises which never traveled far, and which were largely forgotten when Providence grew to be a metropolis with a shifting modern population. The general fact is that the house was never considered, by the solid part of the community, as in any real sense haunted. There were no widespread tales of rattling chains, cold currents of air, extinguished lights or faces at the window. Extremists sometimes said the house was unlucky, but that is as far as ever they went. What was really beyond dispute is that a frightful proportion of persons died there, or, more accurately, had died there, since after some peculiar happenings over sixty years ago the building had become deserted through the sheer impossibility of renting it. These persons were not all cut off suddenly by any one cause. Rather did it seem that their vitality was insidiously sapped, so that each one died the sooner from whatever tendency to weakness he may have naturally had. And those who did not die displayed in varying degree a type of anemia or consumption, and sometimes a decline of the mental faculties, which spoke ill for the salubriousness of the building. Neighboring houses, it must be added, seemed entirely free from the noxious quality. This much I knew before my insistent questioning led my uncle to show me the notes which finally embarked us both on our hideous investigation. In my childhood the shunned house was vacant, with barren, gnarled, and terrible old trees, long, queerly pale grass, and nightmarishly misshapen weeds in the high terraced yard where birds never lingered. We boys used to overrun the place, and I can still recall my youthful terror not only at the morbid strangeness of this sinister vegetation, but at the eldritch atmosphere and odor of the dilapidated house, whose unlocked front door was often entered in quest of shudders. 
The small paned windows were largely broken, and a nameless air of desolation hung round the precarious paneling, shaky interior shutters, peeling wallpaper, falling plaster, rickety staircases, and such fragments of battered furniture as still remained. The dust and cobwebs added their touch of the fearful, and brave indeed was the boy who would voluntarily ascend the ladder to the attic, a vast raftered length lighted only by small blinking windows at the gable ends, and filled with a massive wreckage of chests, chairs, and spinning wheels which infinite years of deposit had shrouded and festooned into monstrous and hellish shapes. But, after all, the attic was not the most terrible part of the house. It was the dank, humid cellar, which somehow exerted the strongest repulsion on us, even though it was wholly above ground on the street side, with only a thin door and window-pierced brick wall to separate it from the busy sidewalk. We scarcely knew whether to haunt it in spectral fascination, or to shun it for the sake of our souls and our sanity. For one thing, the bad odor of the house was strongest there, and for another thing, we did not like the white fungus growths which occasionally sprang up in rainy summer weather from the hard earth floor. These fungi, grotesquely like the vegetation in the yard outside, were truly horrible in their outlines, detestable parodies of toadstools and Indian pipes, whose like we had never seen in any other situation. They rotted quickly, and at one stage became slightly phosphorescent, so that nocturnal passers-by sometimes spoke of witch-fires glowing behind the broken panes of the fetter-spreading windows. We never, even in our wildest Halloween moods, visited this cellar by night, but in some of our daytime visits could detect the phosphorescence, especially when the day was dark and wet. There was also a subtler thing we often thought we detected, a very strange thing which was, however, merely suggestive at most. I refer to a sort of cloudy whitish pattern on the dirt floor, a vague shifting deposit of mold or nitre which we sometimes thought we could trace amid the sparse fungus growths near the huge fireplace of the basement kitchen. Once in a while it struck us that this patch bore an uncanny resemblance to a doubled-up human figure, though generally no such kinship existed, and often there was no whitish deposit whatever. On a certain rainy afternoon, when this illusion seemed phenomenally strong, and when, in addition, I had fancied I glimpsed a kind of thin, yellowish, shimmering exhalation rising from the nitrous pattern toward the yawning fireplace, I spoke to my uncle about the matter. He smiled at this odd conceit, but it seemed that his smile was tinged with reminiscence. Later I heard that a similar notion entered into some of the wild ancient tales of the common folk, a notion likewise alluding to ghoulish, wolfish shapes taken by smoke from the great chimney, and queer contours assumed by certain of the sinuous tree-roots that thrust their way into the cellar through the loose foundation stones. Part Two not till my adult years did my uncle set before me the notes and data which he had collected concerning the shunned house. Dr. Whipple was a sane, conservative physician of the old school, and for all his interest in the place was not eager to encourage young thoughts toward the abnormal. His own view, postulating simply a building and location of markedly unsanitary qualities, had nothing to do with abnormality but he realized that the very picturesqueness which aroused his own interest would, in a boy's fanciful mind, take on all manner of gruesome imaginative associations. The doctor was a bachelor, a white-haired, clean-shaven, old-fashioned gentleman, and a local historian of note, who had often broken a lance with such controversial guardians of tradition as Sidney S. Ryder and Thompson W. Bicknell. He lived with one manservant in a Georgian homestead, with knocker and iron rail steps, balanced eerily on the steep ascent of North Court Street, beside the ancient brick court and colony house where his grandfather, 
a cousin of that celebrated privateersman Captain Whipple, who burnt His Majesty's armed schooner Gaspee in 1772, had voted in the legislature on May 4, 1776, for the independence of the Rhode Island colony. Around him, in the damp, low-sealed library, with the musty white paneling, heavy carved overmantel, and small-paned, vine-shaded windows, were the relics and records of his ancient family, among which were many dubious allusions to the shunned house in Benefit Street. That pest spot lies not far distant, for Benefit runs ledgewise just above the courthouse along the precipitous hill up which the first settlement climbed. When, in the end, my insistent pestering and maturing years evoked from my uncle the hoarded lore I sought, there lay before me a strange enough chronicle, long-winded, statistical, and drearily genealogical as some of the matter was, there ran through it a continuous thread of brooding, tenacious horror and preternatural malevolence, which impressed me even more than it had impressed the good doctor. Separate events fitted together uncannily, and seemingly irrelevant details held minds of hideous possibilities. A new and burning curiosity grew in me, compared to which my boyish curiosity was feeble and inchoate. The first revelation led to an exhaustive research, and finally to that shuddering quest which proved so disastrous to myself and mine. For at the last my uncle insisted on joining the search I had commenced, and after a certain night in that house he did not come away with me. I am lonely without that gentle soul whose long years were filled only with honor, virtue, good taste, benevolence, and learning. I have reared a marble urn in his memory in St. John's churchyard, the place that Poe loved, the hidden grove of giant willows on the hill, where tombs and headstones huddle quietly between the hoary bulk of the church and the houses and bank walls of Benefit Street. The history of the house opening amidst a maze of dates, revealed no trace of the sinister either about its construction or about the prosperous and honorable family who built it. Yet from the first a taint of calamity, soon increased to boding significance, was apparent. My uncle's carefully compiled record began with the building of the structure in 1763, and followed the theme with an unusual amount of detail. The shunned house, it seems, was first inhabited by William Harris and his wife, Roby Dexter, with their children, Elkanah, born in 1755, Abigail, born in 1757, William, Jr., born in 1759, and Ruth, born in 1761. Harris was a substantial merchant and seaman in the West India trade, connected with the firm of Obadiah Brown and his nephews. After Brown's death in 1761, the new firm of Nicholas, Brown, and Company made him master of the brig Prudence, Providence built of 120 tons, thus enabling him to erect the new homestead he had desired ever since his marriage. The site he had chosen, a recently straightened part of the new and fashionable back street, which ran along the side of the hill above crowded Chesapeake, was all that could be wished and the building did justice to the location. It was the best that moderate means could afford, and Harris hastened to move in before the birth of a fifth child, which the family expected. That child, a boy, came in December, but was still born. Nor was any child to be born alive in that house for a century and a half. The next April sickness occurred among the children, and Abigail and Ruth died before the month was over. Dr. Job Ives diagnosed the trouble as some infantile fever, though others declared it was more of a mere wasting away or decline. It seemed, in any event, to be contagious, for Hannah Bowen, one of the two servants, died of it in the following June. Eli Ledison, the other servant, constantly complained of weakness, and would have returned to his father's farm in Rehoboth, but for a sudden attachment for Mehitabel Pierce, who was hired to succeed Hannah. He died the next year, a sad year indeed, since it marked the death of William Harris himself, 
enfeebled as he was by the climate of Martinique, where his occupation had kept him for considerable periods during the preceding decade. The widowed Roby Harris never recovered from the shock of her husband's death, and the passing of her firstborn Elkana two years later was the final blow to her reason. In 1768 she fell victim to a mild form of insanity, and was thereafter confined to the upper part of the house. Her elder maiden sister, Mercy Dexter, having moved in to take charge of the family. Mercy was a plain, raw-boned woman of great strength, but her health visibly declined from the time of her advent. She was greatly devoted to her unfortunate sister, and had an especial affection for her only surviving nephew, William, who, from a sturdy infant, had become a sickly, spindling lad. In this year the servant Mehitabel died, and the other servant, preserved Smith, left without coherent explanation, or at least with only some wild tales, and a complaint that he disliked the smell of the place. For a time Mercy could secure no more help, since the seven deaths and the case of madness, all occurring within five years' space, had begun to set in motion the body of fireside rumor which later became so bizarre. Ultimately, however, she obtained new servants from out of town. Anne White, a morose woman from that part of North Kingston, now set off as the township of Exeter, and a capable Boston man named Zenas Lowe. It was Anne White who first gave definite shape to the sinister idle talk. Mercy should have known better than to hire anyone from the New Sneck Hill country, for that remote bit of backwoods was then, as now, a seat of the most uncomfortable superstitions. As lately as 1892, an extra community exhumed a dead body and ceremoniously burnt its heart in order to prevent certain alleged visitations injurious to the public health and peace, and one may imagine the point of view of the same section in 1768. Anne's tongue was perniciously active, and within a few months Mercy discharged her, filling her place with a faithful and amiable Amazon from Newport, Maria Robbins. Meanwhile, poor Roby Harris, in her madness, gave voice to dreams and imaginings of the most hideous sort. At times her screams became insupportable, and for long periods she would utter shrieking horrors which necessitated her son's temporary residence with his cousin Peleg Harris in Presbyterian Lane near the new college building. The boy would seem to improve after these visits, and had Mercy been as wise as she was well-meaning, she would have let him live permanently with Peleg. Just what Mrs. Harris cried out in her fits of violence, tradition hesitates to say, or rather presents such extravagant accounts that they nullify themselves through sheer absurdity. Certainly it sounds absurd to hear that a woman, educated only in the rudiments of French, often shouted for hours in a coarse and idiomatic form of that language, or that the same person, alone and guarded, complained wildly of a staring thing which bit and chewed at her. In 1772 the servant Zenas died, and when Mrs. Harris heard of it, she laughed with a shocking delight utterly foreign to her. The next year she herself died, and was laid to rest in the north burial ground beside her husband. Upon the outbreak of trouble with Great Britain in 1775, William Harris, despite his scant sixteen years and feeble constitution, managed to enlist in the Army of Observation under General Green, and from that time on enjoyed a steady rise in health and prestige. In 1780, as a captain in the Rhode Island forces in New Jersey under Colonel Angel, he met and married Phoebe Hetfield of Elizabethtown, whom he brought to Providence upon his honorable discharge in the following year. The young soldier's return was not a thing of unmitigated happiness. The house, it is true, was still in good condition, and the street had been widened and changed in name from Back Street to Benefit Street. But Mercy Dexter's once robust frame had undergone a sad and curious decay, so that she was now a stooped and pathetic figure with hollow voice and disconcerting pallor, qualities shared to a singular degree by the one remaining servant, Maria. In the autumn of 1782, 
Phoebe Harris gave birth to a stillborn daughter, and on the 15th of the next May, Mercy Dexter took leave of a useful, austere, and virtuous life. William Harris, at last thoroughly convinced of the radically unhealthy nature of his abode, now took steps toward quitting it and closing it forever. Securing temporary quarters for himself and his wife at the newly opened Golden Ball Inn, he arranged for the building of a new and finer house in Westminster Street, in the growing part of the town across the Great Bridge. There, in 1785, his son Duty was born, and there the family dwelt till the encroachments of commerce drove them back across the river and over the hill to Angel Street, in the newer East Side Residence District, where the late Archer Harris built his sumptuous but hideous French-roofed mansion in 1876. William and Phoebe both succumbed to the yellow fever epidemic of 1797, but duty was brought up by his cousin Rathbone Harris, Peleg's son. Rathbone was a practical man, and rented the benefit house despite William's wish to keep it vacant. He considered it an obligation to his ward to make the most of all the boy's property, nor did he concern himself with the deaths and illnesses which caused so many changes of tenants, or the steadily growing aversion with which the house was generally regarded. It is likely that he felt only vexation when, in 1804, the town council ordered him to fumigate the place with sulphur, tar, and gum camphor on account of the much-discussed deaths of four persons, presumably caused by the then-diminishing fever epidemic. They said the place had a febrile smell. Duty himself thought little of the house, for he grew up to be a privateersman, and served with distinction on the Vigilant under Captain Cahoon in the War of 1812. He returned unharmed, married in 1814, and became a father on that memorable night of 1723-1815, when a great gale drove the waters of the bay over half the town, and floated a tall sloop well up Westminster Street, so that its masts almost tapped the Harris's window in symbolic affirmation that the new boy, Welcome, was a seaman's son. Welcome did not survive his father, but lived to perish gloriously at Friedrichsburg in 1862. Neither he nor his son, Archer, knew of the shunned house as other than a nuisance almost impossible to rent, perhaps on account of the mustiness and sickly odor of unkempt old age. Indeed, it never was rented after a series of deaths culminating in 1861, which the excitement of the war tend to throw into obscurity. Carrington Harris, last of the male line, knew it only as a deserted and somewhat picturesque center of legend until I told him my experience. He had meant to tear it down and build an apartment house on the site, but after my account decided to let it stand, install plumbing, and rent it nor has he yet had any difficulty in obtaining tenants. The horror has gone. Part 3 It may well be imagined how powerfully I was affected by the annals of the Harrises. In this continuous record there seemed to me to brood a persistent evil beyond anything in nature as I had known it, an evil clearly connected with the house and not with the family. This impression was confirmed by my uncle's less systematic array of miscellaneous data, legends transcribed from servant gossip, cuttings from the papers, copies of death certificates by fellow physicians, and the like. All this material I cannot hope to give, for my uncle was a tireless antiquarian and very deeply interested in the shunned house, but I may refer to several dominant points which earn notice by their recurrence through many reports from diverse sources. For example, the servant gossip was practically unanimous in attributing to the fungus and malodorous cellar of the house a vast supremacy in evil influence. There had been servants, and White especially, who would not use the cellar kitchen, and at least three well-defined legends bore upon the queer quasi-human or diabolic outlines assumed by tree-roots and patches of mold in that region. These latter narratives interested me profoundly on account of what I had seen in my boyhood, 
but I felt that most of the significance had in each case been largely obscured by additions from the common stock of local ghost lore. Anne White, with her extra superstition, had promulgated the most extravagant and at the same time most consistent tale, alleging that there must lie buried beneath the house one of those vampires, the dead who retain their bodily form and live on the blood or breath of the living, whose hideous legions send their praying shapes or spirits abroad by night. To destroy a vampire, one must, the grandmothers say, exhume it and burn its heart, or at least drive a stake through that organ. And Anne's dogged insistence on a search under the cellar had been prominent in bringing about her discharge. Her tales, however, commanded a wide audience, and were the more readily accepted because the house indeed stood on land once used for burial purposes. To me their interest depended less on this circumstance than on the peculiarly appropriate way in which they dovetailed with certain other things. The complaint of the departing servant preserved Smith, who had preceded Anne and never heard of her, that something sucked his breath at night. The dead certificates of the fever victims of 1804, issued by Dr. Chad Hopkins, and showing the four deceased persons all unaccountably lacking in blood, and the obscure passages of poor Roby Harris's ravings, where she complained of the sharp teeth of a glassy-eyed, half-visible presence. Free from unwarranted superstition though I am, these things produced in me an odd sensation which was intensified by a pair of widely separate newspaper cuttings relating to deaths in the shunned house, one from the Providence Gazette and Country Journal of April 12, 1815, and the other from the Daily Transcript and Chronicle of October 27, 1845, each of which detailed an appallingly grisly circumstance whose duplication was remarkable. It seems that in both instances, the dying person, in 1815 a gentle old lady named Stafford, and in 1845 a schoolteacher of middle age named Elizar Durfrey, became transfigured in a horrible way, glaring glassily and attempting to bite the throat of the attending physician. Even more puzzling, though, was the final case which put an end to the renting of the house. A series of anemia deaths preceded by progressive madness, wherein the patient would craftily attempt the lives of his relatives by incisions in the neck or wrist. This was in 1860 and 1861, when my uncle had just begun his medical practice, and before leaving for the front he heard much of it from his elder professional colleagues. The really inexplicable thing was the way in which the victims— ignorant people, for the ill-smelling and wily shunned house could now be rented to no others, would babble maledictions in French, a language they could not possibly have studied to any extent. It made one think of poor Roby Harris nearly a century before, and so moved my uncle that he commenced collecting historical data on the house after listening, some time subsequent to his return from the war, to the first-hand account of Doctors Chase and Whitmarsh. Indeed, I could see that my uncle had thought deeply on the subject, and that he was glad of my own interest, an open-minded and sympathetic interest, which enabled him to discuss with me matters at which others would merely have laughed. His fancy had not gone so far as mine, but he felt that the place was rare in its imaginative potentialities, and worthy of note as an inspiration in the field of the grotesque and macabre. For my part, I was disposed to take the whole subject with profound seriousness, and began at once not only to review the evidence, but to accumulate as much more as I could. I talked with the elderly Archer Harris, then owner of the house, many times before his death in 1916, and obtained from him and his still surviving maiden aunt Alice an authentic corroboration of all the family data my uncle had collected. When, however, I asked them what connection with France or its language the house could have, they confessed themselves as frankly baffled and ignorant as I. Archer knew nothing, 
and all that Miss Harris could say was that an old illusion her grandfather, Duty Harris, had heard of might shed a little light. The old seaman, who had survived his son Welcome's death in battle by two years, had not himself known the legend, but he recalled that his earliest nurse, the ancient Maria Robbins, seemed darkly aware of something that might have lent a weird significance to the French raving of Roby Harris, which she had so often heard during the last days of that hapless woman. Maria had been at the shunned house from 1769 till the removal of the family in 1783, and had seen Mercy Dexter die. Once she hinted to the child duty of a somewhat peculiar circumstance in Mercy's last moments, but he had soon forgotten all about it, save that it was something peculiar. The granddaughter, however, recalled even this much with difficulty. She and her brother were not so much interested in the house as was Archer's son Carrington, the present owner, with whom I talked after my experience. Having exhausted the Harris family of all the information it could furnish, I turned my attention to early town records and deeds with a zeal more penetrating than that which my uncle had occasionally shown in the same work. What I wished was a comprehensive history of the site from its very settlement in 1636, or even before if any Narragansett Indian legend could be unearthed to supply the data. I found at the start that the land had been part of the long strip of home lot granted originally to John Throckmorton, one of many similar strips beginning at the town street beside the river and extending up over the hill to a line roughly corresponding with the modern Hope Street. The Throckmorton lot had later, of course, been much subdivided, and I became very assiduous in tracing that section through which Back or Benefit Street was later run. It had, as rumor indeed said, been the Throckmorton graveyard, but as I examined the records more carefully, I found that the graves had all been transferred at an early date to the North Burial Ground on the Pawtucket West Road. Then suddenly I came, by a rare piece of chance, since it was not in the main body of records, and might easily have been missed, upon something which aroused my keenest eagerness, fitting in as it did with several of the queerest phases of the affair. It was the record of a lease in 1697, of a small tract of ground, to an Etienne Roulette and his wife. At last the French element had appeared, that and another deeper element of horror which the name conjured up from the darkest recesses of my weird and heterogeneous reading. And I feverishly studied the platting of the locality as it had been before the cutting through and partial straightening of Back Street between 1747 and 1758. I found what I had half expected, that where the shunned house now stood, the roulettes had laid out their graveyard behind a one-story and attic cottage, and that no record of any transfer of graves existed. The document, indeed, ended in much confusion, and I was forced to ransack both the Rhode Island Historical Society and Shepley Library before I could find a local door which the name of Etienne Roulette would unlock. In the end I did find something, something of such vague but monstrous import, that I set about at once to examine the cellar of the shunned house itself, with a new and excited minuteness. The roulettes, it seemed, had come in 1696 from East Greenwich, down the west shore of Narragansett Bay. They were Huguenots from Claude, and had encountered much opposition before the Providence selectmen allowed them to settle in the town. Unpopularity had dogged them in East Greenwich, whither they had come in 1686, after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and rumor said that the cause of dislike extended beyond mere racial and national prejudice, or the land disputes which involved other French settlers with the English in rivalries which not even Governor Andros could quell. But their ardent Protestantism, too ardent, some whispered, and their evident distress when virtually driven from the village down the bay, had moved the sympathy of the town fathers. Here the strangers had been granted a haven, and the swarthy Etienne roulette, 
less apt at agriculture than at reading queer books and drawing queer diagrams, was given a clerical post in the warehouse at Pardon Tinglehast's Wharf, far south in Town Street. There had, however, been a ride of some sort later on, perhaps forty years later, after old Roulette's death, and no one seemed to hear of the family after that. For a century or more, it appeared, the Roulettes had been well remembered and frequently discussed as vivid incidents in the quiet life of a New England seaport. Etienne's son, Paul, a surly fellow whose erratic conduct had probably provoked the riot which wiped out the family, was particularly a source of speculation, and though Providence never shared the witchcraft panics of her Puritan neighbors, it was freely intimated by old wives that his prayers were neither uttered at the proper time nor directed toward the proper object. All this had undoubtedly formed the basis of the legend known by old Maria Robbins. What relation it had to the French ravings of Roby Harris and other inhabitants of the shunned house, imagination or future discovery alone would determine. I wondered how many of those who had known the legends realized that additional link with the terrible which my wider reading had given me that ominous item in the annals of morbid horror which tells of the creature jacques roulette of claude who in fifteen ninety eight was condemned to death as a demoniac but afterwards saved from the stake by the paris parliament and shut in a madhouse he had been found covered with blood and shreds of flesh in a wood shortly after the killing and rending of a boy by a pair of wolves one wolf was seen to lope away unhurt. Surely a pretty hearthside tale, with a queer significance as to name and place. But I decided that the Providence gossips could not have generally known of it. Had they known, the coincidence of names would have brought some drastic and frightened action. Indeed, might not its limited whispering have precipitated the final riot which erased the roulettes from the town? I now visited the accursed place with increased frequency, studying the unwholesome vegetation of the garden, examining all the walls of the building, and poring over every inch of the earthen cellar floor. Finally, with Carrington Harris's permission, I fitted a key to the disused door opening from the cellar directly upon Benefit Street, preferring to have a more immediate access to the outside world than the dark stairs, ground-floor hall, and front door could give. There, where morbidity lurked most thickly, I searched and poked during long afternoons when the sunlight filtered in through the cobwebbed above-ground windows, and a sense of security glowed from the unlocked door, which placed me only a few feet from the placid sidewalk outside. Nothing new rewarded my efforts only the same depressing mustiness and faint suggestions of noxious odors and nitrous outlines on the floor, and I fancy that many pedestrians must have watched me curiously through the broken panes. At length, upon a suggestion of my uncle's, I decided to try the spot nocturnally, and one stormy midnight ran the beams of an electric torch over the moldy floor with its uncanny shapes and distorted half-phosphorescent fungi. The place had dispirited me curiously that evening, and I was almost prepared when I saw, or thought I saw, amid the whitish deposits, a particularly sharp definition of the huddled form I had suspected from boyhood. Its clearness was astonishing and unprecedented, and as I watched, I seemed to see again the thin, yellowish, shimmering exhalation which had startled me on that rainy afternoon so many years before. Above the anthropomorphic patch of mold by the fireplace it rose, a subtle, sickish, almost luminous vapor, which, as it hung trembling in the dampness, seemed to develop vague and shocking suggestions of form, gradually trailing off into nebulous decay and passing up into the blackness of the great chimney with a fetter in its wake. It was truly horrible, and the more so to me because of what I knew of the spot. Refusing to flee, I watched it fade, 
and as I watched, I felt that it was in turn watching me greedily, with eyes more imaginable than visible. When I told my uncle about it, he was greatly aroused, and after a tense hour of reflection, arrived at a definite and drastic decision. Weighing in his mind the importance of the matter, and the significance of our relation to it, he insisted that we both test, and if possible destroy, the horror of the house by a joint night or nights of aggressive vigil in that musty and fungus-cursed cellar. Part 4 On Wednesday, June 25th, 1919, after a proper notification of Carrington Harris, which did not include surmises as to what we expected to find, my uncle and I conveyed to the shunned house two camp chairs and a folding camp cot, together with some scientific mechanism of greater weight and intricacy. These we placed in the cellar during the day, screening the windows with paper and planning to return in the evening for our first vigil. We had locked the door from the cellar to the ground floor, and having a key to the outside cellar door, were prepared to leave our expensive and delicate apparatus, which we had obtained secretly and at great cost, as many days as our vigils might be protracted. It was our design to sit up together till very late, and then watch singly till dawn in two hour stretches, myself first, and then my companion, the inactive member resting on the cot. The natural leadership with which my uncle procured the instruments from the laboratories of Brown University and the Cranston Street Armory, and instinctively assumed direction of our venture, was a marvelous commentary on the potential vitality and resilience of a man of eighty-one. Elihu Whipple had lived according to the hygienic laws he had preached as a physician, and, but for what happened later, would be here in full vigor today. Only two persons suspected what did happen. Carrington Harris and myself. I had to tell Harris because he owned the house, and deserved to know what had gone out of it. Then, too, we had spoken to him in advance of our quest, and I felt, after my uncle's going, that he would understand and assist me in some vitally necessary public explanations. He turned very pale, but agreed to help me, and decided that it would now be safe to rent the house. To declare that we were not nervous on that rainy night of watching would be an exaggeration, both gross and ridiculous. We were not, as I have said, in any sense childishly superstitious, but scientific study and reflection had taught us that the known universe of three dimensions embraces the merest fraction of the whole cosmos of substance and energy. In this case an overwhelming preponderance of evidence from numerous authentic sources pointed to the tenacious existence of certain forces of great power and, so far as the human point of view is concerned, exceptional malignancy. To say that we actually believed in vampires or werewolves would be a carelessly inclusive statement. Rather, must it be said that we were not prepared to deny the possibility of certain unfamiliar and unclassified modifications of vital force and attenuated matter? as existing very infrequently in three-dimensional space because of its more intimate connection with other spatial units, yet close enough to the boundary of our own to furnish us occasional manifestations which we, for lack of a proper vantage point, may never hope to understand. In short, it seemed to my uncle and me that an incontroversible array of facts pointed to some lingering influence in the shunned house, traceable to one or another of the ill-favored French settlers of two centuries before, and still operative through rare and unknown laws of atomic and electronic motion. That the family of Roulette had possessed an abnormal affinity for outer circles of entity, dark spheres which for normal folk hold only repulsion and terror, their recorded history seemed to prove. Had not then the riots of those bygone seventeen-thirties set moving certain kinetic patterns in the morbid brain of one or more of them, notably the sinister Paul Roulette, which obscurely survived the bodies murdered and buried by the mob, 
and continued to function in some multiple dimensioned space along the original lines of force determined by a frantic hatred of the encroaching community? Such a thing was surely not a physical or biochemical impossibility in the light of a newer science which includes the theories of relativity and intra-atomic action. One might easily imagine an alien nucleus of substance or energy, formless or otherwise, kept alive by imperceptible or immaterial subtractions from the life force or bodily tissue and fluids of other and more palpably living things into which it penetrates and with whose fabric it sometimes completely merges itself. It might be actively hostile, or it might be dictated merely by blind motives of self-preservation. In any case, such a monster must of necessity be in our scheme of things an anomaly and an intruder, whose extirpation forms a primary duty with every man not an enemy to the world's life, health, and sanity. What baffled us was our utter ignorance of the aspect in which we might encounter the thing. No sane person had ever seen it, and few had ever felt it definitely. It might be pure energy, a form ethereal and outside the realm of substance, or it might be partly material, some unknown and equivocal mass of plasticity capable of changing at will to nebulous approximations of the solid, liquid, gaseous, or tenuously unparticled states. The anthropomorphic patch of mold on the floor, the form of the yellowish vapor, and the curvature of the tree roots in some of the old tales, all argued at least a remote and reminiscent connection with the human shape. But how representative or permanent that similarity might be, none could say with any kind of certainty. We had devised two weapons to fight it. A large and specially fitted Crook's tube, operated by powerful storage batteries, and provided with peculiar screens and reflectors, in case it proved intangible and opposable only by vigorously destructive ether radiations, and a pair of military flamethrowers of the sort used in the World War, in case it proved partly material and susceptible of mechanical destruction, for, like the superstitious Exeter rustics, we were prepared to burn the thing's heart out, if heart existed to burn. All this aggressive mechanism we set in the cellar, in positions carefully arranged with reference to the cot and chairs, and to the spot before the fireplace where the mold had taken strange shapes. That suggestive patch, by the way, was only faintly visible when we placed our furniture and instruments, and when we returned that evening for the actual vigil. For the moment I half doubted that I had ever seen it in the more definitely limed form, but then I thought of the legends. Our cellar vigil began at 10 p.m., daylight saving time, and as it continued we found no promise of pertinent developments. A weak, filtered glow from the rain-harassed street lamps outside, and a feeble phosphorescence from the detestable fungi within, showed the dripping stone of the walls, from which all traces of whitewash had vanished. The dank fetid and mildew-tainted hard earth floor with its obscene fungi, the rotting remnants of what had been stools, chairs, and tables, and other more shapeless furniture, the heavy planks and massive beams of the ground floor overhead, the decrepit plank door leading to bins and chambers beneath other parts of the house, the crumbling stone staircase with ruined wooden handrail, and the crude and cavernous fireplace of the blackened brick, where rusted iron fragments reveal the past presence of hooks and irons, spit crane and a door to the Dutch oven, these things, and our austere cot and camp chairs, and the heavy and intricate destructive machinery we had brought. We had, as in our own former explorations, left the door to the street unlocked, so that a direct and practical path of escape might lie open in case of manifestations beyond our power to deal with. It was our idea that our continued nocturnal presence would call forth whatever malign entity lurked there, and that, being prepared, we could dispose of the thing with one or the other of our provided means as soon as we had recognized and observed it sufficiently. 
How long it might require to evoke and extinguish the thing, we had no notion. It occurred to us, too, that our venture was far from safe, for in what strength the thing might appear no one could tell. But we deemed the game worth the hazard, and embarked on it alone and unhesitatingly, conscious that the seeking of outside aid would only expose us to ridicule and perhaps defeat our entire purpose. Such was our frame of mind as we talked far into the night, till my uncle's growing drowsiness made me remind him to lie down for his two hours' sleep. Something like fear chilled me as I sat there in the small hours alone. I say alone, for one who sits by a sleeper is indeed alone, perhaps more alone than he can realize. My uncle breathed heavily, his deep inhalations and exhalations, accompanied by the rain outside, and punctuated by another nerve-wracking sound of distant dripping water within, for the house was repulsively damp even in dry weather, and in this storm positively swamp-like. I studied the loose, antique masonry of the walls in the fungus light, and the feeble rays which stole in from the street through the screen window and once, when the noisome atmosphere of the place seemed about to sicken me, I opened the door and looked up and down the street, feasting my eyes on familiar sights and my nostrils on wholesome air. Still nothing occurred to reward my watching, and I yawned repeatedly, fatigue getting the better of apprehension. Then the stirring of my uncle in his sleep attracted my notice. He had turned restlessly on the cot several times during the latter half of the first hour, but now he was breathing with unusual irregularity, occasionally heaving a sigh which held more than a few of the qualities of a choking moan. I turned my electric flashlight on him and found his face averted, so rising and crossing to the other side of the cot, I again flashed the light to see if he seemed in any pain. What I saw unnerved me most surprisingly, considering its relative triviality. It must have been merely the association of any odd circumstances with the sinister nature of our location and mission, for surely the circumstance was not in itself frightful or unnatural. It was merely that my uncle's facial expression, disturbed no doubt by the strange dreams which our situation prompted, betrayed considerable agitation and seemed not at all characteristic of him. His habitual expression was one of kindly and well-bred calm, whereas now a variety of emotions seemed struggling within him. I think, on the whole, that it was this variety which chiefly disturbed me. My uncle, as he gasped and tossed in increasing perturbation, and with eyes that had now started open, seemed not one but many men and suggested a curious quality of alienage from himself. All at once he commenced to mutter, and I did not like the look of his mouth and teeth as he spoke. The words were at first indistinguishable, and then, with a tremendous start, I recognized something about them which filled me with icy fear till I recalled the breadth of my uncle's education and the interminable translations he had made from anthropological and antiquarian articles in the Revue des Deux Mondes, for the venerable Elihu Whipple was muttering in French, and the few phrases I could distinguish seemed connected with the darkest myths he had ever adapted from the famous Paris magazine. Suddenly a perspiration broke out on the sleeper's forehead, and he leaped abruptly up half awake. The jumble of French changed to a cry in English, and the hoarse voice shouted excitedly, My breath! My breath! Then the awakening became complete, and with a subsidence of facial expression to the normal state, my uncle seized my hand and began to relate a dream whose nucleus of significance I could only surmise with a kind of awe. He had, he said, floated off from a very ordinary series of dream pictures, into a dream whose strangeness was related to nothing he had ever read. It was of this world, and yet not of it, a shadowy geometrical confusion in which could be seen elements of familiar things in most unfamiliar and perturbing combinations. 
there was a suggestion of queerly disoriented pictures superimposed one upon another, an arrangement in which the essentials of time, as well as of space, seemed dissolved and mixed in the most illogical fashion. In this kaleidoscopic vortex of phantasmal images were occasional snapshots, if one might use the term, of singular clearness but unaccountable heterogeneity. Once my uncle thought he lay in a carelessly dug open pit, with a crowd of angry faces framed by straggling locks and three-cornered hats frowning down on him. Again, he seemed to be in the interior of a house, an old house apparently, but the details and inhabitants were constantly changing, and he could never be certain of the faces or the furniture, or even of the room itself, since doors and windows seemed in just as great a state of flux as the presumably more mobile objects. It was queer, damnably queer, and my uncle spoke almost sheepishly, as if half expecting not to be believed, when he declared that of the strange faces many had unmistakably borne the features of the Harris family, and all the while there was a personal sensation of choking, as if some pervasive presence had spread itself through his body and sought to possess itself of his vital processes. I shuddered at the thought of those vital processes, worn as they were by eighty-one years of continuous functioning, in conflict with unknown forces of which the youngest and strongest system might well be afraid, but in another moment reflected that dreams are only dreams, and that these uncomfortable visions could be at most no more than my uncle's reaction to the investigation and expectations which had lately filled our minds to the exclusion of all else. Conversation, also, soon tended to dispel my sense of strangeness, and in time I yielded to my yawns, and took my turn at slumber. My uncle seemed now very wakeful, and welcomed his period of watching, even though the nightmare had roused him far ahead of his allotted two hours. Sleep seized me quickly, and I was at once haunted with dreams of the most disturbing kind. I felt in my visions a cosmic and abysmal loneness, with hostility surging from all sides upon some prison where I lay confined. I seemed bound and gagged, and taunted by the echoing yells of distant multitudes who thirsted for my blood. My uncle's face came to me with less pleasant association than in waking hours, and I recall many futile struggles and attempts to scream. It was not a pleasant sleep, and for a second I was not sorry for the echoing shriek which clove through the barrier of dream and flung me to a sharp and startled awakeness in which every actual object before my eyes stood out with more than natural clearness and reality. Section 5 I had been lying with my face away from my uncle's chair, so that in this sudden flash of awakening I saw only the door to the street the window and the wall and floor and ceiling toward the north of the room, all photographed with morbid vividness on my brain in a light brighter than the glow of the fungi or the rays from the street outside. It was not a strong, or even a fairly strong light, certainly not nearly strong enough to read an average book by, but it cast a shadow of myself and the cot on the floor, and had a yellowish penetrating force that hinted at things more potent than luminosity. This I perceived with unhealthy sharpness, despite the fact that two of my other senses were violently assailed, for on my ears rang the reverberations of that shocking scream, while my nostrils revolted at the stench which filled the place. My mind, as alert as my senses, recognized the gravely unusual, and almost automatically I leaped up and turned about to grasp the destructive instruments which we had left trained on the moldy spot before the fireplace. As I turned, I dreaded what I was to see, for the scream had been in my uncle's voice, and I knew not against what menace I should have to defend him and myself. Yet, after all, the sight was worse than I had dreaded. There are horrors beyond horrors and this was one of those nuclei of all dreamable hideousness which the cosmos saves to blast an accursed and unhappy few. 
Out of the fungus-ridden earth steamed up a vaporous, corpse light, yellow and diseased, which bubbled and lapped to a gigantic height in vague outlines half-human and half-monstrous, through which I could see the chimney and fireplace beyond. It was all eyes, wolfish and mocking, and the rugose insect-like head dissolved at the top to a thin stream of mist which curled putridly about and finally vanished up the chimney. I say that I saw this thing, but it is only in conscious retrospection that I ever definitely traced its damnable approach to form. At the time it was to me only a seething, dimly phosphorescent cloud of fungus loathsomeness, enveloping and dissolving to an abhorrent plasticity the one object on which all my attention was focused. That object was my uncle, the venerable Elihu Whipple, who, with blackening and decaying features, leered and gibbered at me, and reached out dripping claws to rend me in the fury which this horror had brought. It was a sense of routine which kept me from going mad. I had drilled myself in preparation for the crucial moment, and blind training saved me. Recognizing the bubbling evil as no substance reachable by matter or material chemistry, and therefore ignoring the flamethrower which loomed on my left, I threw on the current of the crook's tube apparatus, and focused toward that scene of immortal blasphemousness, the strongest ether radiations which man's art can rouse from the spaces and fluids of nature. There was a bluish haze and a frenzied sputtering, and the yellowish phosphorescence grew dimmer to my eyes. But I saw the dimness was only that of contrast, and that the waves from the machine had no effect whatever. Then in the midst of that demoniac spectacle, I saw a fresh horror which brought cries to my lips, and sent me fumbling and staggering toward that unlocked door to the quiet street, careless of what abnormal terrors I loosed upon the world, or what thoughts or judgments of men I brought down upon my head. In that dim blend of blue and yellow the form of my uncle had commenced a nauseous liquefaction, whose essence eludes all description and in which there played across his vanishing face such changes of identity as only madness can conceive. He was at once a devil and a multitude, a charnel house and a pageant, lit by the mixed and uncertain beams that gelatinous face assumed a dozen, a score, a hundred aspects. Grinning as it sank to the ground on a body that melted like tallow in the caricatured likeness of legions strange and yet not strange. I saw the features of the Harris line, masculine and feminine, adult and infantile, and other features old and young, coarse and refined, familiar and unfamiliar. For a second there flashed a degraded counterfeit of a miniature of poor mad Roby Harris that I had seen in the School of Design Museum, and another time I thought I caught the raw-boned image of Mercy Dexter as I recalled her from a painting in Carrington Harris's house. It was frightful beyond conception. Toward the last, when a curious blend of servant and baby visages flickered close to the fungoid floor, where a pool of greenish grease was spreading, it seemed as though the shifting features fought against themselves, and strove to form contours like those of my uncle's kindly face. I like to think that he existed at that moment, and that he tried to bid me farewell. It seems to me I hiccuped a farewell from my own parched throat as I lurched out into the street, a thin stream of grease following me through the door to the rain-drenched sidewalk. The rest is shadowy and monstrous. There was no one in the soaking street, and in all the world there was no one I dared tell. I walked aimlessly south past College Hill and the Athenaeum, down Hopkins Street, and over the bridge to the business section, where tall buildings seemed to guard me as modern material things guard the world from ancient and unwholesome wonder. Then gray dawn unfolded wetly from the east, silhouetting the archaic hill and its venerable steeples, 
and beckoning me to the place where my terrible work was still unfinished. And in the end I went, wet, hatless, and dazed in the morning light, and entered that awful door in Benefit Street, which I had left ajar and which still swung cryptically in full sight of the early householders to whom I dared not speak. The grease was gone, for the moldy floor was porous, and in front of the fireplace was no vestige of the giant doubled-up form traced in niter. I looked at the cot, the chairs, the instruments, my neglected hat, and the yellowed straw hat of my uncle. Dazedness was uppermost, and I could scarcely recall what was dream and what was reality. Then thought trickled back, and I knew that I had witnessed things more horrible than I had dreamed. Sitting down, I tried to conjecture, as near as sanity would let me, just what had happened, and how I might end the horror, if indeed it had been real. Matter it seemed not to be, nor ether, nor anything else conceivable by mortal mind. What, then, but some exotic emanation, some vampirish vapor, such as Exeter rustics tell of as lurking over certain churchyards? This, I felt, was the clue, and again I looked at the floor before the fireplace where the mold and the niter had taken strange forms. In ten minutes my mind was made up, and taking my hat I set out for home, where I bathed, ate, and gave by telephone an order for a pickaxe, a spade, a military gas mask, and six carboys of sulfuric acid, all to be delivered the next morning at the cellar door of the shunned house in Benefit Street. After that I tried to sleep, and, failing, passed the hours in reading and in the composition of inane verses to counteract my mood. At eleven a.m. the next day I commenced digging. It was sunny weather, and I was glad of that. I was still alone, for as much as I feared the unknown horror I sought, there was more fear in the thought of telling anybody. Later I told Harris, only through sheer necessity, and because he had heard odd tales from old people which disposed him ever so little toward belief. As I turned up the stinking black earth in front of the fireplace, my spade causing a viscous yellow ichor to ooze from the white fungi which it severed, I trembled at the dubious thoughts of what I might uncover. Some secrets of inner earth are not good for mankind, and this seemed to me one of them. My hand shook perceptibly, but still I delved, after a while standing in the large hole I had made. With the deepening of the hole, which was about six feet square, the evil smell increased, and I lost all doubt of my imminent contact with the hellish thing whose emanations had cursed the house for over a century and a half. I wondered what it would look like, what its form and substance would be, and how big it might have waxed through long ages of life-sucking. At length I climbed out of the hole and dispersed the heaped-up dirt, then arranging the great carboys of acid around and near two sides, so that when necessary I might empty them all down the aperture in quick succession. After that I dumped earth only along the other two sides, working more slowly and donning my gas mask as the smell grew. I was nearly unnerved at my proximity to a nameless thing at the bottom of a pit. Suddenly my spade struck something softer than earth. I shuddered and made a motion as if to climb out of the hole, which was now as deep as my neck. Then courage returned, and I scraped away more dirt in the light of the electric torch I had provided. The surface I uncovered was fishy and glassy, a kind of semi-putrid congealed jelly with suggestions of translucency. I scraped further and saw that it had form. There was a rift where a part of the substance was folded over. The exposed area was huge and roughly cylindrical, like a mammoth soft blue-white stovepipe doubled in two, its largest part some two feet in diameter. Still more I scraped, and then abruptly I leaped out of the hole and away from the filthy thing. Frantically unstopping and tilting the heavy carboys, and precipitating their corrosive contents one after another, down that charnel gulf, 
and upon the unthinkable abnormality whose titan elbow I had seen. The blinding maelstrom of greenish yellow vapor, which surged tempestuously up from that hole as the floods of acid descended, will never leave my memory. All along the hill people tell of the yellow day, when virulent and horrible fumes arose from the factory waste dumped in the Providence River, but I know how mistaken they are as to the source. They tell, too, of the hideous roar, which at the same time came from some disordered water-pipe or gas-main underground. But again, I could correct them if I dared. It was unspeakably shocking, and I do not see how I lived through it. I did faint after emptying the fourth carboy, which I had to handle after the fumes had begun to penetrate my mask, but when I recovered, I saw that the hole was emitting no fresh vapors. The two remaining carboys I emptied down without particular result, and after a time I felt it safe to shovel the earth back into the pit. It was twilight before I was done, but fear had gone out of the place. The dampness was less fetid, and all the strange fungi had withered to a kind of harmless grayish powder which blew ash-like along the floor. One of earth's nethermost terrors had perished forever, and if there be a hell, it had received at last the demon soul of an unhallowed thing. And as I patted down the last spadeful of mold, I shed the first of many tears with which I have paid unaffected tribute to my beloved uncle's memory. The next spring, no more pale grass and strange weeds came up in the shunned house's terraced garden, and shortly afterward Carrington Harris rented the place. It is still spectral, but its strangeness fascinates me, and I shall find mixed with my relief a queer regret when it is torn down to make way for a tawdry shop or vulgar apartment building. The barren old trees in the yard have begun to bear small, sweet apples, and last year the birds nested in their gnarled boughs. End of The Shunned House Chapter 6 of 7 H. P. Lovecraft Stories Dagon is a story by H. P. Lovecraft written in July 1917 and first published in the November edition of The Vagrant. Dagon by H. P. Lovecraft. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet on which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation, so that our vessel was made legitimate prize, while we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors, that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shore of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. 
The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I awaked, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished, for there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime, Yet the very completeness of the stillness and homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions which for innumerable millions of years had lain hidden beneath unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, strain my ears as I might nor were there any sea-fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I lay thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side, and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a far-away hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. By the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me, but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound, and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illuminate. I felt myself on the edge of the world, 
peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost, and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about an hundred yards ahead of me, an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books consisting, for the most part, of conventualized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Plainly visible across the intervening water, on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas-reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of Doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine, which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint, grotesque beyond the imagining of a Poe or a Bueller. They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale represented as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendants had perished errors before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing 
whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then, suddenly, I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemus-like, and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head, and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad, then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal, and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they would not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist, and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish-god, but soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient secrece and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Often I ask myself if it could not have all been a pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever, as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man-of-war. This I ask myself. But ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols, and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows, to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind, of a day when the land shall sink, and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amid universal pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand, the window, the window. End of Dagon Chapter 7 The Tomb Sedibus ut saltim placidis in morte quiescam. Virgil In relating the circumstances which have led to my confinement within this refuge for the demented, I am aware that my present position will create a natural doubt of the authenticity of my narrative. It is an unfortunate fact that the bulk of humanity is too limited in its mental vision to weigh with patience and intelligence those isolated phenomena seen and felt only by a psychologically sensitive few which lie outside its common experience. Men of broader intellect know that there is no sharp distinction betwixt the real and the unreal, that all things appear as they do only by virtue of the delicate individual physical and mental media through which we are made conscious of them, but the prosaic materialism of the majority condemns as madness the flashes of supersight which penetrate the common veil of obvious empiricism. My name is Jervis Dudley, 
and from earliest childhood I have been a dreamer and a visionary. Wealthy beyond the necessity of a commercial life, and temperamentally unfitted for the formal studies and social recreations of my acquaintances, I have dwelt ever in realms apart from the visible world, spending my youth and adolescence in ancient and little-known books, and in roaming the fields and groves of the region near my ancestral home. I do not think that what I read in these books or saw in these fields and groves was exactly what other boys read and saw there. But of this I must say little, since detailed speech would but confirm those cruel slanders upon my intellect, which I sometimes overhear from the whispers of the stealthy attendants around me. It is sufficient for me to relate events without analyzing causes. I have said that I dwelt apart from the visible world, but I have not said that I dwelt alone. This no human creature may do, for lacking the fellowship of the living, he inevitably draws upon the companionship of things that are not or are no longer living. Close by my home there lies a singular wooded hollow, in whose twilight deeps I spent most of my time reading, thinking, and dreaming. Down its moss-covered slopes my first steps of infancy were taken, and around its grotesquely gnarled oak trees my first fancies of boyhood were woven. Well did I come to know the presiding dryads of those trees, and often have I watched their wild dances and the struggling beams of waning moon, but of these things I must not now speak. I will only tell of the lone tomb in the darkness of the hillside thickets, the deserted tomb of the Hydes, an old and exalted family whose last direct descendant had been lain within its black recesses many decades before my birth. The vault to which I refer is an ancient granite, weathered and discolored by the mists and dampness of generations. Excavated back into the hillside, the structure is visible only at the entrance. The door, a ponderous and forbidding slab of stone, hangs upon rusted iron hinges, and is fastened ajar in a queerly sinister way by means of heavy iron chains and padlocks, according to a gruesome fashion of half a century ago. The abode of the race, whose scions are inured, had once crowned the declivity which holds the tomb, but had long since fallen victim to the flames which sprang up from a disastrous stroke of lightning. Of the midnight storm which destroyed this gloomy mansion, the older inhabitants of the region sometimes speak in hushed and uneasy voices, alluding to what they call divine wrath, in a manner that in later years vaguely increased the always strong fascination which I felt for the forest-darkened sepulchre. One man only had perished in the fire. When the last of the Hydes was buried in this place of shade and stillness, the sad urnful of ashes had come from a distant land to which the family had repaired when the mansion burned down. No one remains to lay flowers before the granite portal, and few care to brave the depressing shadows which seem to linger strangely about the water-worn stones. I shall never forget the afternoon when first I stumbled upon the half-hidden house of the dead. It was in midsummer, when the alchemy of nature transmutes the sylvian landscape to one vivid and almost homogeneous mass of green. When the senses are well-nigh intoxicated with the surging seas of moist verdure and the subtly indefinable odors of the soil and the vegetation. In such surroundings, the mind loses its perspective, time and space become trivial and unreal, and echoes of a forgotten prehistoric past beat insistently upon the enthralled consciousness. All the day I had been wandering through the mystic groves of the hollow, thinking thoughts I need not discuss, and conversing with things I need not name. In years a child of ten, I had seen and heard many wonders unknown to the throng, and was oddly aged in certain respects. 
when, upon forcing my way between two savage clumps of briars, I suddenly encountered the entrance of the vault, I had no knowledge of what I had discovered. The dark blocks of granite, the door so curiously ajar, and the funereal carvings above the arch aroused in me no associations of mournful or terrible character. Of graves and tombs I knew and imagined much, but had on account of my peculiar temperament been kept from all personal contact with churchyards and cemeteries. The strange stone house on the woodland slope was to me only a source of interest and speculation, and its cold, damp interior, into which I vainly peered through the aperture so tantalizingly left, contained for me no hint of death or decay. But in that instant of curiosity was born the madly unreasoning desire which has brought me to this hell of confinement. Spurred on by a voice which must have come from the hideous soul of the forest, I resolved to enter the beckoning gloom in spite of the ponderous chains which barred my passage. In the waning light of day, I alternately rattled the rusty implements with a view to throwing wide the stone door, and essayed to squeeze my slight form through the space already provided. But neither plan met with success. At first curious, I was now frantic, and when, in the thickening twilight, I returned to my home, I had sworn to the hundred gods of the grove that at any cost I would some day force an entrance to the black chilly depths that seemed calling out to me. The physician with the iron-gray beard who comes each day to my room once told a visitor that this decision marked the beginning of a pitiful monomania. But I will leave final judgment to my readers when they shall have learned all. The months following my discovery were spent in futile attempts to force the complicated padlock of the slightly open vault, and in carefully guarded inquiries regarding the nature and history of the structure. With the traditionally receptive ears of the small boy, I learned much, though an habitual secretiveness caused me to tell no one of my information or my resolve. It is perhaps worth mentioning that I was not at all surprised or terrified on learning of the nature of the vault. My rather original ideas regarding life and death had caused me to associate the cold clay with the breathing body in a vague fashion, and I felt that the great sinister family of the burned-down mansion was in some way represented within the stone space I sought to explore mumbled tales of the weird rites and godless revels of bygone years in the ancient hall gave to me a new and potent interest in the tomb, before whose door I would sit for hours at a time each day. Once I thrust a candle within the nearly closed entrance, but could see nothing save a flight of damp stone steps leading downward. The odor of the place repelled yet bewitched me. I felt I had known it before, in a past remote beyond all recollection, beyond even my tenancy of the body I now possess. The year after I first beheld the tomb, I stumbled upon a worm-eaten translation of Plutarch's lives in the book-filled attic of my home. Reading the life of Theseus, I was much impressed by that passage telling of the great stone beneath which the boyish hero was to find his tokens of destiny whenever he should become old enough to lift its enormous weight. This legend had the effect of dispelling my keenest impatience to enter the vault, for it made me feel that the time was not yet ripe. Later, I told myself, I should grow to a strength and ingenuity which might enable me to unfasten the heavily chained door with ease, but until then I would do better by conforming to what seemed the will of fate. Accordingly, my watches by the dark portal became less persistent, and much of my time was spent in other, though equally strange, pursuits. I would sometimes rise very quietly in the night, stealing out to walk in those churchyards and places of burial from which I had been kept by my parents. 
What I did there I may not say, for I am not now sure of the reality of certain things, but I know that on the day after such a nocturnal ramble I would often astonish those about me with my knowledge of topics almost forgotten for many generations. It was after a night like this that I shocked the community with a queer conceit about the burial of the rich and celebrated Squire Brewster, a maker of local history, who was interred in 1711, and whose slate headstone, bearing a graven skull and crossbones, was slowly crumbling to powder. In a moment of childish imagination, I vowed not only that the undertaker, Goodman Simpson, had stolen the silver buckle shoes, silken hose, and satin small clothes of the deceased before burial, but that the squire himself, not fully inanimate, had turned twice in his mound-covered coffin on the day of internment. But the idea of entering the tomb never left my thoughts. Being indeed stimulated by the unexpected genealogical discovery that my own maternal ancestry possessed at least a slight link with the supposedly extinct family of the Hydes. Last of my paternal race, I was likewise the last of this older and more mysterious line. I began to feel that the tomb was mine, and to look forward with hot eagerness to the time when I might pass within that stone door and down those slimy stone steps in the dark. I now formed the habit of listening very intently at the slightly opened portal, choosing my favorite hours of midnight stillness for the odd vigil. By the time I came of age, I had made a small clearing in the thicket before the mold-stained façade of the hillside, allowing the surrounding vegetation to encircle and overhang the space like the walls and roof of a sylvan bower. This bower was my temple the fastened door of my shrine, and here I would lie outstretched on the mossy ground, thinking strange thoughts and dreaming of strange dreams. The night of the first revelation was a sultry one. I must have fallen asleep from fatigue, for it was with a distinct sense of awakening that I heard the voices. Of those tones and accents I hesitate to speak, of their quality I will not speak, but I may say that they presented certain uncanny differences in vocabulary, pronunciation, and mode of utterance. Every shade of New England dialect, from the uncouth syllables of the Puritan colonists to the precise rhetoric of fifty years ago, seemed represented in that shadowy colloquy, though it was only later that I noticed the fact. At the time, indeed, my attention was distracted from this matter by another phenomenon, a phenomenon so fleeting that I could not take oath upon its reality. I barely fancied that, as I awoke, a light had been hurriedly extinguished within the sunken sepulchre. I do not think I was either astounded or panic-stricken, but I know that I was greatly and permanently changed that night. Upon returning home I went with much directness to a rotting chest in the attic, wherein I found the key which next day unlocked with ease the barrier I had so long stormed in vain. It was in the soft glow of late afternoon that I first entered the vault on the abandoned slope. A spell was upon me, and my heart leaped with an exultation I can but ill describe. As I closed the door behind me and descended the dripping steps by the light of my lone candle, I seemed to know the way, and, though the candle sputtered with the stifling reek of the place, I felt singularly at home in the musty charnel-house air. Looking about me I beheld many marble slabs bearing coffins, or the remains of coffins. Some of these were sealed and intact, but others had nearly vanished leaving the silver handles and plates isolated amid certain curious heaps of whitish dust. Upon one plate I read the name of Sir Geoffrey Hyde, who had come from Sussex in 1640, and died here a few years later. 
In a conspicuous alcove was one fairly well-preserved and untenanted casket, adorned with a single name which brought to me both a smile and a shudder. An odd impulse caused me to climb upon the broad slab, extinguish my candle, and lie down within the vacant box. In the gray light of dawn I staggered from the vault and locked the chain of the door behind me. I was no longer a young man, though but twenty-one winters had chilled my bodily frame. Early rising villagers who observed my homeward progress looked at me strangely and marveled at the signs of rivaled revelry which they saw in one whose life was known to be sober and solitary. I did not appear before my parents till after a long and refreshing sleep. Henceforward I haunted the tomb each night, seeing, hearing, and doing things I must never reveal. My speech, always susceptible to environmental influences, was the first thing to succumb to the change and my suddenly acquired orgasm of diction was soon remarked upon. Later a queer boldness and recklessness came into my demeanor, till I unconsciously grew to possess the bearing of a man of the world, despite my lifelong seclusion. My formerly silent tongue waxed voluble with the easy grace of a Chesterfield, or the godless cynicism of a Rochester. I displayed a peculiar erudition utterly unlike the fantastic monkish lure over which I had poured in youth, and covered the fly-leaves of my books with facile impromptu epigrams, which brought up suggestions of gay, prior, and the sprightliest of Augustan wits and rhymesters. One morning at breakfast I came close to disaster by declaring in palpably licorice accents an infusion of eighteenth-century bacchanalian mirth a bit of Georgian playfulness never recorded in a book, which ran something like this. Come hither, my lads, with your tankards of ale, and drink to the present before it shall fail. Pile each on your platter a mountain of beef, for it is eating and drinking that bring us relief. So fill up your glass, so life will soon pass. When you're dead, ye'll ne'er drink to your king or your lass. An Oceron had a red nose, so they say. But what's a red nose if you're happy and gay? Gad split me, I'd rather be red whilst I'm here than white as a lily and dead half a year. So, Betty, my miss, come give me a kiss. In hell there's no innkeeper's daughter like this. Young Harry, propped up just as straight as he's able, will soon lose his wig and slip under the table. But fill up your goblets and pass em around, Better under the table than under the ground. So revel and chaff as ye thirstily quaff, Under six feet of dirt tis less easy to laugh. The fiends strike me blue, I'm scarce able to walk, And damn me if I can stand upright or talk. Here, landlord, bid Betty to summon a chair. I'll try home for a while, for my wife is not there. So lend me a hand, I'm not able to stand, but I'm gay whilst I linger on top of the land. About this time I conceived my present fear of fire and thunderstorms. Previously indifferent to such things, I had now an unspeakable horror of them, and would retire to the innermost recesses of the house whenever the heavens threatened an electrical display. A favorite haunt of mine during the day was the ruined cellar of the mansion that had burned down, and in fancy I would picture the structure as it had been in its prime. On one occasion I startled a villager by leading him confidently to a shallow sub-cellar, of whose existence I seemed to know, in spite of the fact that it had been unseen and forgotten for many generations. At last came that which I had long feared. My parents, alarmed at the altered manner and appearance of their only son, commenced to exert over my movements a kindly espionage which threatened to result in disaster. I had told no one of my visits to the tomb, having guarded my secret purpose with religious zeal since childhood, but now I was forced to exercise care in threading the mazes of the wooded hollow that I might throw off a possible pursuer. My key to the vault I kept suspended from a cord about my neck, its presence known only to me. 
I never carried out of the sepulchre any of the things I came upon whilst within its walls. One morning, as I emerged from the damp tomb and fastened the chain of the portal with none too steady hand, I beheld, in an adjacent thicket, the dreaded face of a watcher. Surely the end was near, for my bower was discovered and the objective of my nocturnal journeys revealed. The man did not accost me, so I hastened home in an effort to overhear what he might report to my careworn father. Were my sojourns beyond the chain door about to be proclaimed to the world? Imagine my delighted astonishment on hearing the spy inform my parent, in cautious whisper, that I had spent the night in the bower outside the tomb, my sleep-filmed eyes fixed upon the crevice where the padlocked portal stood ajar. By what miracle had the watcher been thus deluded? I was now convinced that a supernatural agency protected me. Made bold by this heaven-sent circumstance, I began to resume perfect openness in going to the vault, confident that no one would witness my entrance. For a week I tasted to the full the joys of that charnel conviviality which I must not describe, when the thing happened, and I was borne away to this accursed abode of sorrow and monotony. I should not have ventured out that night, for the taint of thunder was in the clouds, and hellish phosphorescence rose from the rank swamp at the bottom of the hollow. The call of the dead, too, was different. Instead of the hillside tomb, it was the charred cellar on the crest of the slope whose presiding demon beckoned to me with unseen fingers. As I emerged from an intervening grove upon the plain before the ruin, I beheld in the misty moonlight a thing I had always vaguely expected. The mansion gone for a century once more reared its stately height to the raptured vision every window ablaze with the splendor of many candles. Up the long drive rolled the coaches of the Boston gentry, whilst on foot came a numerous assemblage of powdered exquisites from the neighboring mansions. With this throng I mingled, though I knew I belonged with the hosts rather than the guests. Inside the hall were music, laughter, and wine on every hand. Several faces I recognized, though I should have known them better had they been shriveled or eaten away by death and decomposition. Amid a wild and reckless throng, I was the wildest and most abandoned. Gay blasphemy poured in torrents from my lips, and in my shocking sallies I heeded no law of God, man, or nature. Suddenly a peal of thunder, resonant even above the din of the swinish revelry, clave the very roof, and laid a hush of fear upon the boisterous company. Red tongues of flame and searing gusts of heat engulfed the house, and the roisterers, struck with terror at the descent of a calamity which seemed to transcend the bounds of unguided nature, fled, shrieking into the night. I alone remained, riveted to my seat by a groveling fear which I had never felt before. And then, a second horror took possession of my soul. Burnt alive to ashes, my body dispersed by the four winds, I might never lie in the tomb of Hydes. Was not my coffin prepared for me? Had I not a right to rest till eternity amongst the descendants of Sir Geoffrey Hyde? I, I would claim my heritage of death even though my soul go seeking through the ages for another corporeal tenement to represent it on that vacant slab in the alcove of the vault. Gervase Hyde should never share the sad faith of Polynorus. As the phantom of the burning house faded, I found myself screaming and struggling madly in the arms of two men, one of whom was the spy who had followed me to the tomb. Rain was pouring down in torrents, and upon the southern horizon were flashes of the lightning that had so lately passed over our heads. My father, his face lined with sorrow, stood by as I shouted my demands to be laid within the tomb, frequently admonishing my captors to treat me as gently as they could. 
a blackened circle on the floor of the ruined cellar, told of a violent stroke from the heavens, and from this spot a group of curious villagers with lanterns were prying a small box of antique workmanship which the thunderbolt had brought to light. Seizing my futile and now objectless writhing, I watched the spectators as they viewed the treasure trove and was permitted to share in their discoveries. The box, whose fastenings were broken by the stroke which had unearthed it, contained many papers and objects of value, but I had eyes for one thing alone. It was the porcelain miniature of a young man in a smartly curled bag-wig, and bore the initials J. H. The face was such that as I gazed I might well have been studying my mirror. On the following day I was brought to this room with the barred windows, but I have been kept informed of certain things through an aged and simple-minded servitor, of whom I bore a fondness in infancy, and who, like me, loves the churchyard. What I have dared relate of my experiences within the vault has brought me only pitying smiles. My father, who visits me frequently, declares that at no time did I pass the chained portal, and swears that the rusted padlock had not been touched for fifty years when he examined it. He even says that all the village knew of my journeys to the tomb, and that I was often watched as I slept in the bower outside the grim façade, my half-open eyes fixed on the crevice that leads to the interior. Against these assertions I have no tangible proof to offer, since my key to the padlock was lost in the struggle on that night of horrors. The strange things of the past, which I learnt during those nocturnal meetings with the dead, he dismissed as the fruits of my lifelong and omnivorous browsing among the ancient volumes of the family library. Had it not been for my old servant, Hiram, I should have by this time become quite convinced of my madness. But Hiram, loyal to the last, has held faith in me, and has done that which impels me to make public at least a part of my story. A week ago he burst open the lock which chains the door of the tomb perpetually ajar, and descended with a lantern into the murky depths. On a slab in an alcove he found an old but empty coffin, whose tarnished plate bears the single word Gervais. In that coffin, and in that vault, they have promised me I shall be buried. End of The Tomb End of 7 H.P. Lovecraft Stories 